special meeting um, for October 9th, 2018. Uh, present is Ms. Ms. Pitko. Uh, Ms. Leeper is traveling, so she will not be with us. Uh, Mrs. Vitale, Mrs. Gerber, myself, Philip Dwyer, Mrs. Jacobson, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, and Mr. Peterson. If I could ask you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we uh, start through the uh, uh, business items agenda, you'll see that um, we're allowing for public comment at the end uh, for any bus uh, item that's on the agenda. So you, those who may want to make a comment are welcome to stay to the end for public comment. The second comment I'd make is that uh, we had an executive session to consider employee contract uh, issues. We noticed the public session w for the superintendent's conference room. So therefore, on advice of attorney, we uh, actually came back into public session in the conference room, opened the doors, uh, and then acted on the secretary's contract, which uh, was approved um, on a 8-0 vote, Ms. Leepa not being present. So I just wanted to announce publicly um, that the secretary's contract uh, has been approved by the board. Um, so uh, Mill Hill uh, committee update. Uh, as the board knows, um, the uh, chair of the building committee had gone to the board of selectmen and the board of uh, finance to get uh, additional guidance from them. Um, uh, I had invited him to the board of education so that he might hear from individual members of the board any thoughts that they had. Um, of course, the meeting that he was scheduled to be at was then canceled due to weather. Um, and then subsequent to that, he uh, declined to attend. Um, and so um, uh, I just wanted to report that. And in the event that uh, there's any board members who have any comments that they would like to make so that uh, when the building committee is meeting concerning uh, the Mill Hill project, the latest thinking of the Board of Education would be available to Mrs. Gerber to advance um, to the building committee. At the moment, uh, what they have in front of them is our ed specs, uh, which on the central issue calls for a 24 classroom, large classroom building, quote, 504 students, uh, and a memo that you each got a copy of that Dr. Jones and the officers in the liaison to the Board of Finance uh, co-signed that uh, advanced our argument for um, um, the way in which they should approach this project. Um, and so that's what they're relying on in terms of information from the board. So having said that, any comments that people wish to make? And if not, uh, then we'll move on. Ms. Pitko. Can I just have a point of clarification? Because I know that a bunch of this was at the last Board of Finance meeting. <laughs> Were they coming back to us? The building committee? Um, th I think at the Board of Finance meeting, they understood that, that Mr. Quinn understood that he had been invited, but um, that was because I invited him, not because he asked to come to us. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, Mr. Peterson, do you have a comment that I just uh, Just very quickly, I, w I would like to note that Tom Quinn was actually here in the building the night of the, of the rain. Uh, <laughs> he, he did not get the memo in time so just in terms of his dedication he came out in the weather yes. to talk to us that's a that's an important point uh, mr quinn is a dedicated volunteer uh, ms jacobson um i was just wondering if yourself or perhaps jessica or tom i don't know if i don't see him here um had an idea of just where the mill hill building committee is right now in terms of our timeline that we were expected to be at um, well, that did come up at the last uh, meeting, um, which was a couple of weeks ago, um, and I did ask at the time um, if how confident they were that they'd be able to meet that June 30th, 2019 um, deadline to submit to the state. And there was some concern. Um, they didn't say outright no, um, but they certainly said that, you know, based on the timelines that have been put together already they're already a little behind um, they're interviewing architects and will approve an architect of the three that they've shortlisted next thursday um, is going to be the meeting um, uh, but 
you know, there are definitely are concerns that if it has to come to, you know, it has to be obviously be approved by all the town bodies if it takes more than one meeting. If there is a question about changing the ed specs that would have to come to us, um, it could very quickly, plus you're thrown in the middle of the budget season. Um, I think that there, there certainly weren't any guarantees that we'd make that June 30th deadline. So I had expressed at that meeting as the Board of Ed liaison that I was concerned that if that did happen, that would move everything else back is my understanding because it's not as if I'm assuming we'd be able to between now and June 30th say well if for some reason Mill Hill doesn't get approved can we move something else up I, I don't think it works that way so I would just be concerned that everything in our long-range plan would be delayed by a year if that happens I'm not really sure what if anything this board can do about that or even the building committee for that matter I know that they're working very hard and that they're looking forward to having the architect on board and I think they might have a better sense of the timeline once they hire an architect um, but it will be tight at best uh, Mr. Asa, I'm sorry. Did you, no, did you have follow-up questions? <clears throat> um, so, Mr. Chairman, what? So, my understanding was Mr. Quinn went before the Board of Finance um, to express uh, his ideas uh, and, and how the process should flow. Um, and as well as the Board of Selectmen. Um, do we know where those two bodies stand? Because basically, my understanding, what he was proposing would would include a, a redoing of the ed specs on our part and also a new charge from the from the board of selectmen and also a new guidance from the board of finance so are we still on as as far as the board of selectmen are concerned are we still on that same charge as originally projected uh, the charge to the committee has not changed okay. uh, Ms. Jacobson, did you have a follow-up that you wanted to ask? I just did for Dr. Jones. I know you had mentioned, um, Phil, the memo that went out to um, Mr. Quinn and CC to other town bodies, and I was just curious if you had heard any response from them or since that time and if there was any feedback on your ideas on, on the, what you had sent to them. I have not had any um, written response or you know personal correspondence what I can say though is the presentation to the Board of Finance versus the second meeting um, was a little bit different in that first meeting that several of us attended at Osborne Hill where they were initially requesting an additional I believe it was around 300,000 um, when the second presentation that was no longer the case it was going to take additional money out of the planning aspect but they were not asking for dollars above and beyond which tells me the architect must have confirmed that in fact they can do three plans um, you know it really in one document not having to do three separate plans all right thank you mr. Peterson so I guess uh, a couple of comments around the table uh, through through a chair to, to uh, mr. Ace's uh, question at the uh, the Board of Finance's capital planning workshop at the end of uh, September which uh, dr. Jones just referenced uh, there the sense that I got from from that body at that meeting was they were going to defer to the Board of Selectmen. Um, they they were looking for what had changed. It, you know, was any any material change that would uh, necessitate everyone looking at the at the charge again uh, from the from the Board of Finances charge again. Um, that, was, that was my take in any in any event. Um, I, I also kind of I, I want to ask whether it would be appropriate. We're talking about timelines, uh, and this may be a question. Uh, ultimately for the for the building committee um, one of the reasons we asked for these alternates in the beginning was to try to get a rough idea of cost for the various models uh, is there any way that we can kind of in advance of an architect's estimate uh, ask the members of the building committee several of whom have direct experience with projects of this type to just give us a, a rule of thumb a, a rough uh, something just to give us something to chew on before we get an official number I don't know. I don't know whether that's even appropriate, but there are people on that board with a lot of experience. Um, I'll only state my experience with uh, construction. Mr. Ace has had experience with the uh, Holland Hill project. Uh, when you ask an architect to give you a ballpark estimate of cost uh, with only uh, space planning documents to deal with, um, they give you a number that they really, it's just based on general cost estimates. Uh, and then when you get six months later and you have firmer documents and you get a different number, the building committee becomes subject to all sorts of, but you promised us this number and where did this number come from? So I think a lot of times building committees hesitate to throw out a number on just some general cost guidelines. Sure, and, and I think that's fair enough. I just wanted to ask the question. Thank you. 
States. Can I just piggyback on that? Uh, the, my fear on that, I understand where you're getting at, but my fear, um, the whole um, firestorm that started with Mill Hill started with a number that was thrown out there that was not factually based or had really had anything to back it up um, except pure speculation and opinion. So I would recommend let's hold off on that. Um, but while I state that, one, one question I do have is, it appears abundantly clear that a 378 number school um, is really out of the realm of possibility. Um, while this board has agreed and asked for alternates and, and deduct ads um, from 504 to, and, and the other ones, there's three op options that the board building committee is looking at. I, is there a possibility, are we too far down the road to raise that bottom number? Um, or would that have to go, I mean. So I can only give my personal opinion response to that. Um, first, we did not ask for three alternatives. Uh, in order to move the project along, to meet a time frame, we did not object to the Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen doing that. Uh, because for us, the June date is a real critical date. Um, so for the building committee to suggest that the Board of Ed was uh, asking for three different alternatives is not exactly accurate. Um, on the 378, I believe this board has had past conversations that suggest that 18 classroom building would not be acceptable to this board. There was a memo that Mr. Quinn, I believe I'm reading it correctly, sent to the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, in which he said, we've looked at that, but recommend that we not consider that. Uh, and I think when he went to the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen, is they uh, said, we still want you to consider it. Is that a correct statement, Mr. Peterson? One of the things that I took away from Mr. Quinn's presentation before the Board of Selectmen, uh, or I'm sorry, before the Board of Finance, uh, was that they simply wanted to narrow down the number of options to try to focus their efforts better. He did say one or two would be better than three. But they, they he wanted it, his, to narrow it, but they said, his memo, Mr. Quinn's memo, was very clear that 378. He personally, well, yeah. the, the signatories to the to the memo, did not consider that a feasible po possibility. Uh, but I believe the board of selectmen, board of finance, are still interested in seeing that. Yes, and in fact, several members of the board of finance at that uh, September workshop said specifically that they we should look continue to look at 378. And so, if it were me, I would at every occasion say, if you want to look at 378, you're welcome to. But uh, representing the Board of Ed, I would find it hard to believe that the Board of Ed would ever uh, vote Ed Specs at that level. But that is not a vote of this Board to have said, that's a line that we're not going to cross. That's a line that we're going to have to address when it comes back. Okay, so one last thing is, I know we're talking about this June 30th deadline, um, but I would just say, as this process moves along, that is our goal to get it in by the June 30th. But I also don't want to make hasty decisions. Um, so yes, I think we should keep that June 30th in mind and we should keep striving for that. But I don't think it's the end of the world if to get the right project at the right price yeah. that um, I might, I'll, I'll recognize in a second, I might ask Mr. Cullen to explain to us what the the impact of a June 30 deadline. It's uh, not just yet, because I have two board members that want to make a comment, but but uh, who got the hand up first? Uh, Mrs. Gerber. Uh, well, just to speak to the, um, the 378 question, I think a lot of that is more kind of a logistical issue, simply because that's what's in the charge. Um, and that's what's in the bonding resolution. And so if we were to say, absolutely not, you take 378 out, which is kind of what Mr. Quinn was you know, saying yeah. in a very diplomatic way, that would then require going back to the Board of Selectmen, back to the Board of Finance, and it would just take up a tremendous amount of time. So I think the thought was just to say, okay, fine, keep that in there um, and move forward just in, in the term of uh, getting expedience more than anything. Uh, Mrs. Jacobson. Um, thank you. You brought up the right people because I was going to ask the same question about impact of not meeting that June 30th deadline, um, particularly in terms of state reimbursement unknown in the future that we do know for this year um, and any possible consequence for anything else on the waterfall. So, Mr. Cullen. 
Yes, uh, Tom Cullen, Executive Director of Operations. I would defer to Sal. He files all the paperwork in essence of time. Uh, good evening, Sal Morbido, Manager of Construction Security and Safety. Um, if the date is missed, uh, absent any changes in statute, uh, all it means is that we will not get uh, certification by the state legislature to file for reimbursement. We're delayed one whole year. We cannot, cannot submit for reimbursement. So financially, that means that the town is carrying those payments with interest a year longer. Uh, the other change that could happen, and we really won't know until, uh, say, January, February, when the uh, state, the governor, or legislature start proposing new bills, whether our reimbursement rate will be changed. That, that's the biggest unknown. There's, there's just a, a, a wall of fog after June 30th at this point. We don't know what, whether we're going to go off a cliff on reimbursement or everything is smooth sailing. Right. So in the next budget season, a lot of things could change regarding construction requirements, not, only, not in addition to the reimbursement rate. So would you agree that meeting the June 30th, while well, agreeing with Mr. Asa that we don't want to make hasty decisions, of course, um, but it is a strong financial incentive to try to make that deadline because of millions of potential loss in dollars. Yes, that, that's why we strive to get to that day with the information that we know. We know the law, we know the rules, and we know the percentage. Most I know you do. I just want to make sure everyone that else does question, too. Mr. Yeah, but, but to Mr. Jacobson's point, I don't want to throw millions of dollars potentially out there without so we could be talking about going from potential reimbursement to no reimbursement based on legislative action that we don't know about or we could be talking about one or two points difference which wouldn't equate to millions of dollars so I just wanted to make that point. No, that, that's a correct point. Anything else? Uh, Ms. Pitko, Ms. Maxim Canelli and yeah, I have a go ahead, Ms. Pitko. I'm not sure who to ask this through but how realistic is June 30th deadline? Just as I said earlier, the, uh, you know, they didn't say absolutely not, but they said it's going to be tight. Okay. And you know, there, a lot can happen between now and June thirtieth. Um, I mean, first of all, is to get the architect on board, but they agreed that, you know, if it moves optimally through all the town bodies, if there are no issues, if no one asks for a second presentation or a third presentation, which often happens, um, then it should be uh, okay. Um, if that's not the case. Um, if it goes back to the different bodies, if it has to come to us to amend the ed specs, then it, they could have trouble hitting the June 30th deadline as of now. Ms. Max and Canelli. Um, so if, do we know, like, huh, not to put you on the spot through the chair to Mrs. Gerber, at what point will they likely know that June 30th can't happen? Like what, what would be intermediate dates? To be quite honest with you, I, I don't think they really know at this point because there are a lot of moving pieces to this. Um, I mean, again, the first and most important is, of course, hiring the architect, um, you know, and getting a sense of what their timeline is, correct? And th and then just every step along the way. And then again, of course, a lot of unknown has to come through all of the other town bodies um, in terms of the schedule. Again, if it's hitting during budget season, you know, the Board of Finance only has one meeting in April because they've had so many in March. So you know, do they want to have a special meeting? Do they have more questions? That type of thing. So it, 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 there's just a lot of variables that I would hesitate to say, as would the building committee at this point, you know, absolutely not or yes, definitely, because there's just way too many different pieces right now. So and if we're looking at June at the latest, obviously, to RTM? Correct. May latest Board of Finance? Uh, well, actually, the Board of Finance could even go to their first meeting June. That's happened before. I mean, with Ludlow and uh, Osborne Hill, I believe, they went to the Board of Finance at the very, very beginning of June, then to the committee and the RTM for that last meeting in June. So it's, it's, it's doable to wait until June, except, you know, you want to have the Board of Selectmen. But again, that's optimal where you don't have, can you come back for a second meeting or, you know, that type of thing. So the and three, the big, three big pieces that are going to be feeding this final determination, not only the architect of the building, but the, obviously a lot of what we talk about with Mill Hill is the ground in terms of the ledge and how would building this construction, it's not just a matter of the, the cost of the school, it's what it does to the ground. Because mm -hmm. we've told it is not very 
conducive to certain right. kinds of It's a of difficult building. site. Right. It's a difficult site and the traffic study. So all right. those pieces, mm -hmm. is the architect, the architect is not in charge of all those other pieces, those other two pieces. Does the architect take care of the ledge, I mean, the ledge I, assessment? I defer to Mr. Morabito on this one. The, uh, the geotech engineer would be part of the, the architect's team. Okay, so uh, none of that will happen until the architect is set. Right. Uh, the, they're going to hire the architect. The architect would propose uh, who their geotech would be. Uh, that, that's a smaller part. The traffic study, they're talking about doing multiple studies or possibly hiring multiple consultants to do them. That was okay. a statement. Uh, I don't know if they're going to go through that. They'll, they'll talk with their owner reps how that fits into the budget. Uh, but uh, surveying, you have a lot of different things that you have to do, surveying. Uh, the geotech uh, um, test, test pits and cores and things like that, uh, site investigation for utilities. And okay, uh, then I guess my last question is, is that at what point does this impact the 2019-20 budget? Are we, I mean, it, and, and I'm, I ask that in all ignorance, are we do, going ahead with budgeting for this regardless of whether we hit that June 30th deadline or not? Does it impact because then that's we're talking about waterfall if we're uh, well, this is a bonded project so it doesn't right. hit our operating budget for 1920 Correct. and no part and so no part of I guess my point being is that if we didn't go ahead with that so no not budget if we did not go ahead with that as a bonded item would we look to other items for this next year um, I, I, I think uh, mrs. Gerber was re reflecting on that as to if this project moves a year forward uh, it's unlikely that we would be able to say, well, let's slide this project okay. in there unless there was a real emergency, and then the Board of Finance would have to hear it and say, yeah, this makes sense, and it works within the 10 percent, you know, uh, rule that the town has and whatnot. So uh, I, I think it's a big if whether something could be slid in there. But likely not. So we're talking about a project that then will impact Dwight. Jennings, all of those other schools that have renovations waiting yeah. will hinge on this timing. Right. Well, just as a reminder, I mean, this board sees, gets our capital project booklet in December, I believe, correct? December, and then we vote on it in January? Or non-recurring? Or non-recurring. Well, but also the capital projects, too. Right. That, uh, that's what I was referencing. Okay. I mean, that's usually when we get it, is what I'm saying. So then if we were looking to try to change something out, it, it's, we'd be, the timeline wouldn't work because we wouldn't know about Mill Hill until it was too late to get something else in. So I'm just kind of reading what I yeah, said before. It wouldn't be until the springtime that Correct. we might know. As opposed to when we usually get it, which is earlier. So by the time we realized that we wouldn't be able to make that June 30th deadline for Mill Hill, it would be too late to go back. And so even though it is an amount that we're approving, obviously it's an amount with projects, projects named when we're sending it to the other town bodies. Is this a kind of thing where we could say, we're not making it, things have to move, we've already secured a capital budget amount of blank, can at that point, I mean, and we would do this in communication with the other town boards, obviously, because we're talking about a tremendous amount of money here. Could something, I, I, I don't, I, this is unprecedented in my experience. Could a move like that be made in the spring? Could a discussion I, be had? I would had? say no. <laughs> okay. I think, you, I think this board should go forward saying there's such a low percentage chance that we shouldn't contemplate that that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jones? The other thing you get into is it depends on when they decide to bond the project. So, and that would be a Bob Mayer question, and none of us would be qualified to answer that. But generally, when they're bonding, they're bonding for a specific school project. And if that's the way, in fact, that they do it, then you would not be able to utilize those funds for another project. Yeah. Mr. Asa. I just, <laughs> based on the amount of discussion and everything that went on with other town bodies prior to this, even starting and forming a building committee, if we're talking about a tight deadline of trying to get into a June meeting for other town bodies, when we know they're going to be discussing and throwing back at us the different alternatives and everything, I think it's realistic to, to put that out there that this June 30th is highly unlikely for it passing all town bodies. I, I, 
I would represent to them that it is absolutely mandatory and not contemplate that up uh, we know you're not going to make it that's just personal approach any other final comments on this project if not thank you very much for the discussion we'll move on to the presentation on innovative learning thank you um, thank you very much and you have a PowerPoint so you need us to shift over yes sir <coughs> Good evening. My name is Tom Honahan. I'm the uh, eight-week-old technology uh, executive director of digital learning, which is a mouthful to share with you. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to give you this brief update with what we've been doing over the past um, weeks and months for preparing with the uh, innovative learning. So this is a very brief update. Um, sitting with me, I have to my right um, Sheila Ferrara. She is the STEAM and gifted resource teacher at Riverfield in Sherman. To my right is Nikki Callahan, who's the library media specialist at Roger Ludlow Middle School. And to my left is Karen King, who is the Fairfield Ward technology integration teacher. We're going to be looking at a quick overview, um, rolling into the implementation updates at each of the grade levels, and then ending with a brief video. So one of the, the big questions that we would say, why are we going to have innovative learning? And as we focus, focused on this, what would kind of um, summarize how we feel about how we can look forward to energizing not just the staff, but also the students with what is coming forward um, in their education process? So here's a brief video on that.
So as we're walking around classes, I think the concept of having an innovative learning initiative is very different from some neighboring towns have had uh, different types of initiatives regarding one-to-one. -one. And the con concept with innovative learning is what kind of questions can students ask and be participating in using um, new resources. Um, what we're going to show right now is a very brief video on a um, collaborative effort by uh, Mrs. King as well as some students that created a uh, brief video to kind of showcase some of the collaborative things that we can do. So we share that to highlight the students created the artwork. There's a new visualization. So instead of just doing a quick kind of audio podcast, we did something that's a little bit more innovative where students can um, use new resources that are not just available in their classroom but online to um, kind of communicate in, in an authentic way of, of some exciting ideas that they're working on. So moving forward, I'm just going to pass it along to Sheila Farrar, and she's going to give a brief update regarding STEAM in grades three through, three through six. Hi, I just want to let you know um, about the sheer excitement that's going on in three through, it shouldn't be six, it's five. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, our elementary schools only go up to five as far as I know. Anyway, um, so once every six days on our six day rotation, um, I go into every, me and five other teachers, we share all 11 elementary schools and we go in and we get 45 minutes with every third, fourth, and fifth grader. And we always start out with this engineering process. We give them a challenge. We ask them to brainstorm their ideas and get excited about their possibilities. They all have STEAM notebooks where they um, write down their little blueprints for their building ideas. This was a bridge challenge with Kiva planks. Then they, um, they build prototypes and then they move on. They are working in partnerships they they walk around they ask each other questions and they test if it works i mean gravity loves kiva planks they fall apart all the time and the kids just keep smiling and they keep building they test it and then somebody will come around and give them a new challenge like can you make your bridge a double decker bridge and then all of a sudden the design engineering process goes around and around and each week we have a different challenge for the kids depending on our different materials This is, these <laughs> little bullet points were pulled from an email that um, I wrote after the first week of STEAM in every classroom and I was just bursting with energy. Um, it is incredible to see how engaged the students are. You give them a bunch of sponges and popsicle sticks and you tell them to build something fun for a critter and, and they go through that engineering process and they are exploding with excitement. They um, are sharing, they're talking, they're communicating, they're collaborating. They never balk at the partnerships. It's incredible. When things break, they persevere and they laugh at themselves and they keep going. Some kids, I tell them every time when I go in, you're gonna fail miserably today and they smile at me and say, give me the materials, I can't wait. I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> Um, 
the cool thing is is that they are questioning not because I tell them to write down questions they just walk around and ask each other questions and we're not seeing that as much in in every other area we're trying with inquiry we're trying and trying to get them to ask questions and it is just happening happening naturally um, it's ridiculous how exciting it is thank you Sheila so one of the things that I found impressive when I first started was how much of this innovative learning plan was already laid down with the previous technology plan and just Briefly going over a couple, couple components with goal one, engaging in empowering learning. Um, the, the amount of work that has gone into uh, providing a network that can support 3.5 devices at the uh, middle school, at the high school level, has really um, basically proven its strength where we, we haven't hear, heard of many issues, if at all, um, regarding the Wi-Fi issues. Um, the research of the implementation of a one-to-one -one mobile um, computing device, which again is part of this initiative using the Chromebooks. Um, when we come to goal number three, connected teaching and learning, creating an instructional leader, and uh, that's um, very fortunate to be a part of the team um, and help the plan move forward. And uh, certainly with goal number four was part of infrastructure and teacher for learning and manage the wireless system K-12. So as we look forward, we'll, we will continue to reflect on our implementation of, of uh, solid Wi-Fi throughout the um, instructional space. Again, so much of this work had been done um, over the summer um, with a team effort. A district website was created that had the guidebook, a website, um, and additional resources such as the letter to families that was posted on. The guidebook was created for both um, families and for students to access regarding the um, Chromebook. Um, what things that they could use as resources as far as um, in situations for um, I'm having a problem logging in or we can go back into where we can um, use it to um, learn. The website itself was built that had all of these resources in a public space. Um, what to do is, is um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm jumping ahead. In the feedback form, where people would have questions, and this was, this was a little bit later on that I developed uh, with working with the team, is how do we give uh, folks an opportunity, teachers, administrators, staff in the community, to provide feedback for us or ask new questions that we hadn't quite discussed and put that back into the website itself as far as an answered question. Uh, the, implement the implementation timeline was designed to um, be very thoughtful and reflective of which um, building was ready to start with their open house. Um, we had an open house session and then usually a day off and then we started the deployment of the devices so it gave the um, staff and the community some time to think about what was happening and then we gave a, um, a very thoughtful rollout plan to make sure that each grade um, was prepared went through the proper modules, as well as we were testing the uh, infrastructure support and support in general at each building. So over time, it was spread out from the beginning, which was September 13th, all the way through to we just recently deployed our last um, grade seven Chromebooks to um, Roger Ludlow Middle School. So we've com completed the in initial distribution. Um, this next slide is basically going to say, we have um, allocated 3,912 devices. Um, this is include. This is not including the the um, 50 spare devices for the high schools and 30 spare devices at each of the middle schools. Um, we'll be taking a look at um, the, is the um, the support that is needed to continue this. We're taking a look at um, how many students have um, opted in versus how many students have opted out. We're still holding some devices on hand for students that um, we're finding. Some said in the beginning, I don't quite want to uh, give up my personal device, but then they're finding that their um, friends are using um, the Chromebooks and enjoying it very much. And we're finding some folks coming back to us and say, I would like to um, sign out. Um, a Chromebook. So that's our, our current piece. And we are looking at all the um, other different 
data points from each of the buildings to make sure that we're keeping a solid uh, running record of what, what our current needs are. As, as far as device itself, um, I have a daughter who is in, in 10th grade um, and she does have her own personal device and I'm finding that she's using her own device um, much more than her personal device for a variety of reasons. Um, it, the speed is certainly there. The battery power, which we've asked students to um, keep the power adapter at home, um, we're finding that the charge is lasting um, a day or two in many situations. I think we quoted it originally 20 hours, but we're finding that it's quite, quite a long time for um, students to use. There is built-in virus and malware protection. The storage is not on the local machine. It's all up in the cloud, so students do not have to worry about file sizes at all. Um, the automatics are updated through the Chrome browser. Um, Chrome, Google is currently supporting the current operating system for about six years, so that's our an anticipated lifespan for this particular operating system and these devices. Very lightweight, and um, right, the um, only F, um, Fairfield Public students can log into this device. And we told them at the open house, and we shared with parents that um, if you're assigned a particular device, that device is just yours, not to loan it out to anyone else. With regard to safety, we have a bunch of different um, components to that. In addition to the CEN filter, we have an app review um, process that we make sure that every single um, resource that is used is vetted um, from an educational standpoint as well as a student data privacy standpoint. We do not uh, use anything that is um, not approved at the state level. Um, that is something that has been challenging to because we have a lot of new and innovative um, um, resources out there and keeping up with that volume is, is been challenging. That's something I'm going to be looking forward to working with the staff uh, moving forward. Um, students are receiving dig digital citizenship modules as part of the initiative, but also throughout their regular classrooms, how to responsibly use the resource. Um, and when they go home, the big component is, um, and we've mentioned it. Uh, many of the open houses, um, parents can look at their, you cannot delete your browsing history on this. So I've, I've shared many stories with parents say, have a teachable moment with your child to say um, to your son and daughter, what, what are you looking at? Um, can you show me what uh, websites you're going on to? So we do track that from a, a local level and then they cannot delete that. We also have other um, resources that we're looking at monitoring um, online use from um, the uh, director of uh, information technology level to make sure that we're, we're ensuring a safe environment and we'll continue to, to do that with, um, with students moving forward. And I'm going to pass it over to Karen King. Thanks. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the high schools. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the professional development that we're um, using to support our teachers. So we have, um, we've had ongoing um, technology support training and workshops. I've been in this position for four years and um, we've been doing it for longer than that. Um, this past summer we offered um, summer Google workshops that teachers could sign up for in the month of August. We've done um, SAMR training, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, what that is, but we've done that for all departments. Um, it's a model of um, technology integration. And um, we, I go into um, personal learning team meetings, so I invite myself in or teachers invite me in, and we talk about ways that they can integrate technology into their lessons. Um, I'm also available, and we have a tech integrator at the other high school who's available um, anytime for one-on-one, -on -one. so teachers just send us an email, ask for support, um, and we work with them. Uh, we also go into classes and work with the students as well. Uh, we both send out uh, weekly technology tips. I call them my Tuesday tech tips. Um, and then we also have a lot of online resources. There are um, several websites that we are constantly populating with information to support the teachers. Um, to the right, you can see the workshops that we offered. Those are the August workshops. And then some of the resources that are available to the teachers on our websites. So SAMR is a model of technology integration. And it's really just um, a way to support teachers in kind of thinking about wise use of technology in their instruction. And so starting at the bottom is substitution, which is the lowest level, but basically just taking something that you would be doing anyways and then you moving it into the digital world. So maybe the teacher has the students writing a paper and now they 
put them on a Microsoft um, Word, and so they're typing the paper. So they really haven't improved the lesson, they haven't changed the lesson, they're just substituting the technology for a pencil and paper. Um, the next level, as you move up, would be augmentation. And this is a way that somehow the technology is helping to improve the lesson. The lesson's still the same, the, the instruction's pretty much the same, but now we can use the technology to enhance it. So maybe in um, Word, you're using things like spell check or um, you know, some kind of dictionary or whatever. So that just helps the, the writing process. And then we move up to the next level, and this is where we start to see a change in the actual lesson by using the technology. So maybe at modification, um, these, the students are now working in maybe a Google Doc, and they are sharing that Google Doc and collaborating with each other. So instead of one person doing the writing, several people are doing the writing. Um, and then if we move up to redefinition, redefinition is like the highest level would be something that you would not be able to do without the technology. So maybe now the students are working together on this Google Doc and they're collaborating, they finish the doc and now they publish it to the internet, maybe on a blog, and then other people around the world can read what they've written and provide comments or something like that. So that's the SAMR model and we kind of just do the, uh, you know, try to level up, try to think of how you could use the technology wisely in your instruction. Um, and then to talk about the support we're doing for students, um, we're doing digital citizenship. We have several modules of digital citizenship that are being done um, at different times during the school year. Um, so the first one that all students receive prior to receiving their Chromebook was just on Chromebook care, the expectations of how to take care of it, um, how to use it responsibly, you know, the fact they can't we are asking them not to bring their cords to school and so on. Um, then we have a module on cyberbullying, another module on their digital footprint, and then finally one on privacy and security. And we will continue to um, build on these as, the, as time goes by. And then for students, if students need support um, um, for their Chromebook, if there's something wrong, or if they need to learn how to use something, we have the library media specialists, we have the tech integrators like myself, um, we also have the IT technicians available to the students. Um, we have a service request form, which you can see over to the right. Um, we have these in the library, the students come in, they fill out the form, they use a little scanner to scan the barcode for their Chromebook um, and then they bring it up to the um, circulation desk and they trade it and they get a long-term loaner um, and the Chromebook then goes in for service and when it's ready we get it back to them. If a student has forgotten to charge their Chromebook or they forgot to bring their Chromebook, um, they can take a short-term loaner, they can take a daily loaner and just use it for the day and then return that at the end of the day. And eventually we would like to do a student run help desk, especially just as sort of the first, you know, line kind of triage, like what if we can just fix it quickly and it doesn't have to go through that whole process or the students might be able to help the, their, their classmates um, in doing something. So. Thanks. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we rolled things out in the middle school. Um, over the past year, we provided teachers with many very specific professional development opportunities in order to pre prepare for the rollout. However, this type of um, technology in integration instruction for teachers has actually been ongoing for many, many years. The G Suite initiative is probably five or six years old at this point, and we've been supporting teachers <coughs> in planned and point of need uh, professional development since that deployment. Other professional development using digital resources and applications are also offered by building administration as part of the after Tuesday afternoon um, professional development plans. Um, this past year we taught Google uh, Sites, Overview of Chromebooks, Google Classroom, ClassLink, SAMR model at a lot of the after school workshops for teachers. Um, at the library media specialists and tech integration department meetings we continually update our own skills so we could assist teachers in theirs. We attend um, teacher planning meeting during the school day where where we collaborate in uh, developing lessons and unit that integrate technology skills. Um, in addition, we've developed a teacher technology integration website, I think um, Karen mentioned that, that houses many of our workshops as well as handouts, videos of, of lessons um, and instructions. Um, at the middle school level, teachers are also very comfortable in asking for one-on-one -on -one sessions during their planning time in order to learn very specific technology skills. 
Um, in the middle school, we scheduled a digital training day, um, the day after students received their Chromebooks. Each teacher during that day taught a different lesson connected to the Chromebooks. So these lessons were developed by the library media specialists and tech integrations, and we gave them the package lesson to the teachers. Um, so in math class, uh, I think that's up there, uh, they uh, learned about Chromebook guidelines. In science, they did Chromebook tips. In um, we did Google Drive and Language Arts, digital resources and plagiarism in social studies, and um, digital footprint um, in UA classes and video on the Chromebooks in world language. Um, other digital citizenship lessons like website evaluation, search strategy, they're, they're, those are embedded into existing projects. Um, and things like online bullying are covered by the deans, the counseling department, and the, and the health classes. Um, student support. Um, students are supported in both technical and instructional aspects of technology. Specific technical support is offered during homeroom and on an as-needed basis in the library throughout the school day. Our professional digital learning team um, in each building assists students with any technical need. Our goal is to also train a team of students in the middle schools as well. Um, that can also um, provide assistance during homeroom but also point of need instruction in the classrooms. Um, if there are more difficult technical problems arise, students um, borrow a loaner um, and we um, submit the Chromebook for servicing by the tech department. Um, a variety of instructional supports have also been put into place. Each student has a folder in their drive um, that has technology chips in it, troubleshooting hints and safety protocols. We also have a website for students of instructional resources for technical help. Um, instructionally, students receive lessons in technology skills and other digital competencies embedded into their classroom lessons and unit. And both the library media specialists and technology integrators collaborate with teachers to fa facilitate and support that learning. Um, we also have a, uh, very many websites, library websites and tech websites that offer videos, handouts, and 24-7 um, access to instruction. Thank you, Nikki. Um, what, when we prepared for, for the original meeting, which was a couple weeks ago, um, we had a very brief window for which to prepare, but one of the questions we were asking was, um, how is this making an impact um, for you as a teacher? And we asked a similar question to the students. So this is just a very brief video from the beginning of school to um, just prior to the 26th of September. Sadly, my, my backup plan did not work. Um, one of the things I would like to do is post this up on our website. We, so we do have this. It was basically asking a variety of teachers how this has made a positive impact on, on their um, teaching and uh, how many students have had um, sharing the joy of what was, what's been happening with um, receiving the Chromebooks. So unfortunately, I will pass on that. On 
moving forward um, one of the things that I wanted to thank um, the entire crew so much work was done by um, not just the library media specialists and the technology integrators but the technology department preparing everything for the um, the initiative um, it was a very collaborative effort um, a lot of components were gone into not just with the website but planning between um, how do we manage the resources to how we create the lessons um, we are looking forward to the professional development opportunities that are in the coming weeks um, certainly we'll be looking forward to um, creating plans for um, moving forward to next year um, a lot of pieces from a lot of collaborative people um, and it what I feel um, there is a, a bit of a buzz as, as you walk around and talking to students and staff regarding the initiative um, and again it's it's uh, I'm very proud to be part of this but I think the um, big takeaway is this gives uh, uh, students and teachers a, a great opportunity to be creative 24-7 uh, using an equitable uh, device in in all the grades that we've uh, currently deployed this so thank you very much and that concludes the presentation Thank you very much. I, I know I, for one, um, in the last seven years, uh, we've talked about advancing the use of technology in the uh, educational goals of students. And so I very much appreciate the staff's efforts to take the next step. Um, questions from the board? Mr. Peterson. I thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I, have, I have several things, some of which are small, and I have a, I have a significant correction. Um, uh, I do want to say that uh, at having a middle schooler and a high schooler, I've gotten my hands on these devices. The, uh, they're, they're solid, which is a comfort. Uh, and the cases that they handed out at the uh, middle school are very nice. Uh, quick question, are the, are the uh, Ludlow ones yellow or gold? They're black. Yeah, they're black. Oh, okay. So they, they match the school colors, which I guess is the important <laughs> point. Uh, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned very, well, I, I thought that was a nice touch. Um, you mentioned uh, that you've been having few issues with the in-school networks. I know that was a concern with rolling so many devices on. Right. Part of, uh, on the feedback form, uh, I had asked and we shared with the staff if you have a challenge or um, provide feedback of what's working, accommodations, recommendations. Um, we've been monitoring um, the Wi-Fi in areas. Um, we have not heard a tremendous amount of issues. I know there's an occasional issue, um, and that was part of the rollout to make sure that as we went from grade to grade to grade, um, that the network was designed to, to handle the increased load. Um, I mentioned before, um, in speaking with Nancy um, Burns, the Director of Technology, um, that it was designed for 3.5 devices. Now, we know in some areas if there's you know, a, a complete flood, um, we were going to monitor that um, to ensure that the instructional time was, was what it was designed to do. Okay. Um, uh, just a couple other things. I guess uh, a larger, a broader question. I, uh, first, a comment. Uh, maybe this is more appropriate for, the, uh, uh, for Dr. Jones. This would have been great to see in the spring. Um, just, uh, you know, we, we recently sat before the Board of Finance, and it seemed like, you know, there was a lot of sense uh, in the public that this especially since these devices came home represented a rollout of a of a major initiative and just it, it might have been nice to see this see this beforehand but uh, that may be more more food for thought uh, for the future I, you know the one thing that I'm wondering about and I, I actually I feel like uh, on a basic level I, I really am behind this approach but but to what degree is the shift toward working on Chromebooks supported by kind of outcomes based research I think when you look at this type of initiative is the amount of teacher passion to create new learning and new learning experiences was very minimal using a CART model. So when we look at um, a passionate lesson that a, a teacher spends a good amount of time on, be it innovative or, or using technology, um, when we look at this, 
we're going to have more opportunities to see increased um, use of the technology. So when we look at the, the um, outcomes of this, I think we're going to be looking moving forward is, is student engagement, is authentic um, pieces of, um, of work that the students are creating, um, increased collaboration. Sure. From a student achievement piece, I think we're going to have to look at that long term to see um, are we seeing more engagement, which we would hope would have more uh, student achievement. Right. I mean, I guess my, my question is, was there that data before making this decision for making this curriculum switch? Yeah, I might, I might actually speak to that. The, da the data really na nationwide, and really I'd say globally, is not 110 percent in one direction or the other. What I can tell you is that from an educator standpoint, obviously student engagement, um, teacher excitement for their profession and teaching are definitely. Sure. I will say, though, if you actually look at most of the high-performing school districts um, who are even on some assessments that we don't necessarily like um, because, you know, it, the federal government makes us give them, they tend to have uh, more access to technology. And we were just in this discussion um, last week about you know, even at our elementary level, and we're not advocating this level of technology, but we have such limited access that when our third graders are practicing for a, a technology assessment, it is online, and they're complex assessments, our children don't get a lot of practice. Some of the districts who are performing better than us in Connecticut have access. So we do believe that we're going to see increased results. And that's even really high school. Some of the uh, high schools that we chase a little bit have more access than we do. No, and that's, and that's fair. And I, I, I want to say that I understand this is, I don't want to say it's an embryonic yeah. issue, but we are, we are at the beginning. And, but outcomes are something that Absolutely. would be obviously <coughs> useful to track. Uh, and and if the, the board will indulge me. The correction, uh, I was surprised to see the, um, the Google video that introed the thing uh, imply that powered flight was invented by the Wright brothers, uh, as opposed to <laughs> Bridgeport in 1901 by Gustav Whitehead. Well, speaking of it, it and, and I think uh, this would be an example where you just say, yeah. point taken. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions that people have? Ms. Pitko, followed by Mr. Asa. So I'm actually a teacher. I teach science. Um, and I teach for Trafford Public Schools at Benel High School. And we, too, just started a one-to-one -one initiative. Um, my question through the chair, and I'm sorry, I don't know who this belongs to, how are you monitoring what the students are doing on these devices? I can tell you as a teacher, in the last five weeks, walking around the room, having to monitor every device that the student is on task, not Googling something that's inappropriate. I'm, I know in my district what we do. I'm curious what you do to monitor what they're searching, what they're actively doing on these. Um, from, from clarification, from a teacher standpoint or from a? Oh, the district. District. He's gone to a lifeline. <laughs> what was the name of that show? Um, I am Nancy Burns, the Director of Technology for the District. Um, we have a number of different things in place um, for monitoring, uh, but we purposely selected not to do some, I would call it like very heavy duty, you know, log into every kid's screen and see what they're doing. Um, we were really concerned about independence and privacy. Um, but we do have tracking of, I think uh, Mr. Honeyhan referred to it earlier, of what internet activity students are, are um, going to in a number of levels. We have um, internal filtering. We also have um, external filtering. We're actually, um, don't tell the kids, but we're tracking what they're doing on the internet at home. So if there's a question or a concern, we'll know. Um, so we are sort of filtering what they're doing at home as well to make sure they're not going someplace they shouldn't. Um, I think that's about it. Yes, I might also say we do make a conscious choice, which some districts don't, to blacklist things that would be whitelisted. Right. And blacklist means right. they're not allowed in this district. Um, and I, probably even our email is probably one of the biggest examples. A lot of districts have wide open email where their students are emailing anybody they want in the country or the world. We've actually made, a, again, a conscious choice. Ours is intra for learning and for educational purpose. So we, we do blacklist quite a few things. Mm -hmm. We're conservative. I think there's a pro and con to everything. I think the amount of time that our children are on screens um, is alarming. 
and I, I obviously could see the pro as a teacher, but now I'm spending an exponential amount of time on screen to come up with lessons that are not certainly just searching the answer because we don't need encyclopedias anymore, we have Google. So it was the PTA who put on um, the documentary screenagers and worrying about, you know, statistically, our students up to adolescents how much time they're spending on this and then going home and doing homework on it too. So I, I, I would just be cautious that that anyone in the building is not using it strictly just for search engines, that there is some true purpose to using these Chromebooks, that they're actually doing a lesson to, like you said, it's not just substituting, it's not just argumentatively changing it because it has spell check, that if we could give enough time for PD for the teachers to appropriately create something for the students to use them. I think it's too easy for my students personally to come in, open the Chromebook while the class is getting started and some students distract easily. The Chromebook is going to be a distraction. I have to say I think uh, they're doing a great job out at the school in helping the teachers with some of that and I, I do think it's because they the whole team of tech technology folks have done their homework so our I'll give you an example where I was at uh, Ludlow the other day and I know Ward I think does the same thing but they already had you know the signal kind of um, posters made for the teachers so that right when the students walk in the classroom they know if it's put it away uh, you know partial screen open and ready or it's wide open and ready to go so that that classroom management component you don't have kids just walking in starting to Google um, and not knowing what the direction is even before the teachers started the instruction so I think you know credit to, to the folks sitting in front of us have done a really good job to help the teachers and it'll be a growing and learning process so actually through the chair to dr. Jones can we get a timeline to when exactly we started implementing this initiative because I know the timeline of when we had the discussion at the board table and I remember the questions very carefully because I did ask about yep. teachers getting PD I was under the assumption at that meeting that these were going to be chrome carts and the question was asked were they going home and the answer was told to us was no no they were not and I think these people can probably validate that uh, they came to me at the very end of the school year and it was a very difficult decision to make I knew it was economically the right decision if the teachers and the staff felt like it was educationally we were going to be ready for it I could support it but that is not where we were that's not where the discussion was all during the year and again it's credit to them for really making sure they updated some of those resources over the summer because it looked very different rolling out devices and getting parent meetings ready for that versus you know having more carts and access so that is correct all through the budget it was no we weren't sending them home so when was the decision made because my understanding is the report is the children knew in June well I, when I emailed the board I think was June 9th and and from right at the beginning of June till June 30th when we were busy we had to get busy and pre-purchase if we were going to do it so that is when we decided Okay, if I go back to the June 9th memo, though, it doesn't say the Chromebooks are going home with the kids. What I, what I would say is, um, because we had this discussion at the District Improvement Plan and at the Board of Finance, I would ask that we maybe talk offline more about that because we've already discussed it publicly a couple of times, um, especially with, when they're here to talk about more of the instruction. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Asa. Um, <coughs> so, uh, for Ms. Burns. Um, so I know, for example, like my employer issues me an iPad, and they have this massa 360 or whatever. I'm sure it's some sort of thing to watch what I do. Um, and uh, is that similar to what's on here? Is it just if you could just because I want to piggyback on Miss Pitko's thing. That was one of my concerns. And Very similar to what you're describing. Okay. Um, we have a couple of different things that actually work um, because it's an internet-based device. It makes it rather easy to track. Okay. Um, and without giving out too much detail so they can figure out a way around it because yeah. they're so incredibly brilliant out there um, we have mechanisms now so that we can track everything they're doing and where they're doing it okay um, so <laughs> in school on the FPS network I would assume there's firewalls and blocks and Absolutely. if they try to pull there's up there's firewalls and we go through the connected education network which has additional firewalls okay. um, they also do our uh, content filtering for us we also have filtering on the firewall level we have reporting on the firewall level um, as well as what Google provides to us natively um, and some other products that we've um, kind of layered on to give us um, other kinds of reporting and access if we okay. need it. And, and when they're off the FPS network uh, at home, um, it's just um, 
a little bit more of an honor policy, or it's those same no, a lot of those same features are still available. Obviously, they're not going to go through the, the edu Connected Education Network, but they do actually um, phone home okay. um, for, again, I, I could talk offline about gotcha. more details. No, no worries. Um, um, and, but and yeah, is they, there do, they do phone home so we can keep track. We can keep the kids off of the more egregious places that we don't want them, at, as Dr. Okay. Jones uh, refer to the blacklisting mm -hmm. um, and these systems that we use um, basically use algorithms based on the content of sites and they constantly update um, the websites that are blacklisted. Okay and um, I apologize if this was stated but these are Wi-Fi only devices or there is a um, component of connectivity off of a Wi-Fi? There's some offline capability. There are okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's minimal though. Okay, and in reference on page five of our handout um, with the numbers, the device distribution, um, you mentioned 50 spares at the high school and then you went on to say 30 at each middle school. That's so correct. is it is it 50 at each high school correct. and 30 at each high school? That's correct. Okay. That, that was what Middle, we purchased. I'm sorry, middle school. Yep. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Any other board members' comments and or questions? Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, thank you. Um, so several questions a little bit all over the place. Um, first of all, uh, through the chair to Dr. Jones, does the, the seventh graders having this, will they be able to do the SBAC testing on the Chromebook, or are they capable of that? They're, they're capable of it, and they're already pre-programmed to set it up. I just talked to my staff about that this morning. So that should make that there's smoother and less intrusive. Yeah, yeah, there's a little, yeah, no, no reason to worry about it. Really yeah. Correct, smoother yeah. and less, okay. Um, I, I would also just, ha as a caution, um, from the board thinking and obviously as part of our language of, of equating student engagement with student achievement um, because it goes without saying that a, a very engaged student at their desk in front of a Chromebook is not necessarily mo making any progress towards achievement. Um, I had the interesting experience today of teaching in my class while my paired social studies teacher was teaching and I watched while they online did my homework in that other class and uh, proceeded to give none of them credit for it but it's just um, which yeah that was a great moment um, and but, but I, I can't help but just always be concerned just kind of piggybacking on Ms. Pickles the irony that we're watching this incredible excitement in grades three through five which has nothing to do with screens to my delight to looking at what we're trying to do for innovative learning in, in the high school. And I would love for that spirit to carry over more. I couldn't believe in it more. You know, quick plug to Odyssey of the Mind. It's, it's all the exact same idea and had, does not need a one iota of technology mm -hmm. for that. So that, you know, not to equate innovative um, learning with necessarily technology, not that I don't recognize that the tools can be useful. Um, so I'd also had questions about monitoring student use, but I think you have gone beyond what I could have hoped for for that so I'm, I'm quite thrilled about that are there any pilot programs in place right now um, either in the middle school or the high school with perhaps some of the more experienced teachers where who are clearly you know more advanced in terms of their use of technology and are there is there anything in place where they're either they're invited to present to create pilots where something can be tried out for perhaps expansion for other teachers I mean, kind of a step up from just a, hey, learn from your peer, you know, something on a, on a bigger scale. So on Thursday, um, we have professional development. We have a half day, the students are released. And at Ward High School, we have teacher-led PD workshops. So um, David Ebling <coughs> sent out a, a request for teachers to volunteer to offer a workshop for their peers. And then we put together the offerings and put out a form where teachers are signing up for um, those workshops. And what's going to be the follow-up for that? So I, I, I've, I've been in so many standalone PDs which were interesting and I walked out the door and they remained just that interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think when, I, I, don't, I don't say anything bad, but when you bring someone from the outside and they're not really in tune with what's going on in the building, I think that can oftentimes happen because you don't really know what's going on in that building and what the needs are. But these are teachers who are doing these things in their classrooms presently and they're showing their peers how, what things that, you know, they can do in their classroom. So I think it's something that you, I mean, most of the workshops when I'm looking at, these are things that a teacher can take the next day and work on in their classroom. Okay, but so to answer my question, and, and it could very well be that it's far too early for this, the idea of actually trying to pilot something that is significantly different, where I'm not talking about just tweaks, you're not at a stage yet of trying to do anything like that. You know, piloting, um, whether it's a whole, you know, a portfolio, pro I mean, a a anything of that, 
I'm, I'm vague because I haven't done like them myself. Like the English teachers but are working do. on doing e-portfolios, and we have a lot of these kinds of projects in the works. I mean, you know, putting the Chromebooks, and we've been using the technology. Yeah, I mean, this has been ongoing for a long time. I mean, well, Nick, you would like to add. I do want to talk a little bit about technology, technology integration in the middle schools a little bit. We've been doing this for years. This, this is just a new tool that is helpful to what we've been doing for probably five, six, or seven years. <clears throat> we've been working on um, adding rigor into units and lessons um, and having technology help us do that. Uh, for years, we have projects that have um, five or six years old that um, teachers have had to use carts or labs for that are very, very high-end um, creation level, evaluation level kind of lessons and units. I would be more than happy to have anyone in the Board of Ed stop by Roger Ludlow Middle School at any time and look at some of these um, projects that we have developed over the last eight to ten years almost. Uh, so this is not, this idea of integrating technology and using technology for much higher level thinking and outcomes um, has already been going on. We're not starting that. We're starting, we're giving a tool to every kid. We're not starting the idea of technology adding value to instruction. That's been going on a long time. I just want you to be really aware of that. And I'm going to answer the pilot question because, first of all, I've always heard in this district you're not supposed to say that word, but I don't know why. <laughs> so I can tell you we, we all stay away from it what, for whatever, I don't know the history. Um, but what I would say is what we really want in, what you want in any district is organic. You know, you really want the teacher who has a real, um, they're, fear, they're fearless, you know, they're willing to take a risk, they want to try something new, and if they approach their headmaster or they approach us, we want to give them the tools that they want and the resources that they need to do that. Would that in the old day be called a pilot? Perhaps. Um, I think some of our teachers that wanted more access to a cart early on had more access to the cart. It was either right next to their room or it was housed in their room and that was to allow those teachers to plant the seeds in the building to help their other colleagues grow because when you look at that SAMR model, for some teachers that substitution level is a really big deal just to have a device in the room. Then there are other teachers who they've been redefining their lessons and they're working cross-curricular, they're um, authentic learning with children, but the whole idea is to get that more systemic. And so we've got lots of pockets of absolute greatness, and we still have some teachers who are nervous because they haven't integrated as much, and they want to. Um, so we're allowing everybody to be at their own level, and I think that's another aspect of how we're approaching it is we're allowing everybody to grow at their own level. And I think where this can be very challenging in school districts is when you go out and say, you must use your Chromebook X amount of days a week or so many hours, we're trying to allow our teachers to really grow and and love what they're doing and not feel that stress and pressure. And I think, I think we're doing a good job of that. It's early, but you know, we're, we're really trying. Well, and I very much appreciate hearing that because I know that's very important. Um, I had a question regarding the STEAM implementation because all of the um, language that you were using uh, were very much on the, the skills, you know, the, the collaboration, the excitement. We heard about the excitement quite a bit, which again, I know is it's something we're desperate to capture and carry forward into middle school and high school and, and to maintain that. Uh, what I didn't hear is anything about the underlying science in terms of obviously that they're they might be learning, but at what level are they metacognitively aware that they just learned about how to construct something, the science behind it, the technology behind it, the engineering behind it. I didn't hear any of that. Right. Well, we have designed um, three marking periods, and the first one is building. So that's kind of what you saw. You know, we're building with a lot of different materials, but then we get into um, our second market period is all about coding and all about how to um, have a computer speak to, again, screen time, but hopefully it will be tied in in our last marking period with robotics and so we have a lot of spheros and w Lego we do's and rock and box and I could list them all little Ozobots and all these different things where the kids are now going to be um, bringing everything they learned in the engineering process and the coding process forward to make it all work 
Now, I don't know if that speaks to your science -y question because we do have new science standards with the NGSS and everything is exciting and happening in that area. So we didn't want to become a complete science, another science curriculum because the teachers are building lessons and wonderful things about science. We didn't want to take over um, you know, all the math, the math curriculum, STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, you know, mathematics. We didn't want to take over the math curriculum. We didn't, we just really are embracing the engineering side of STEAM and trying to incorporate little bits of all of those areas to, to tie it all in together, if that makes sense. And we're also, um, the inquiry, the inquiry that comes with social studies around those standards, the new standards, the inquiry process that comes with the science standards, the inquiry that comes with all of our research in the Library and Media Center and all the maker spaces that are happening in the Library and Media Center. We're trying to just be the glue that brings all that together. I can't say we're doing, I mean, we, we got wonderful microscopes delivered. I, I don't know what we're going to do with them yet, but we're really excited to use them. You know, we're just going to dabble with what was purchased and see where it goes to sort of support all those other curricular areas. And so I guess I'm asking for the explicit connection between what I would, and I don't, this is not derogatory, mm -hmm. an explicit connection between play and what they are learning. That I mean, they are essentially getting some geometry in there, some yes. physics in there. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it's there, but if they don't realize it's there, it's, I think, harder to tap into later. And, and so I, that's what I'm asking for is where is that expl explicit piece of the play that you're doing recognize that you are replicating a physical model to achieve a purpose and hopefully that because it's learned through play right it stays with them and it's fun but there's still that explicit piece and it could be that this is all new and this is what you're working on but that's what I'm not hearing well I think for instance today we did inclined planes simple machines Right. It was, a, they had to first learn how to use these incredibly difficult rock and box. They're, they're, if you've ever used them, they snap together. They take these little keys to take apart. It, so my whole lesson today was can they even put them together and can they even take them apart in 45 minutes? But they were building an inclined plane. And we watched a brain pop video on inclined planes and we talked about in our world where are inclined planes. And they had to blueprint and draw inclined planes and then they had to try to build them. I mean, I was thrilled that they got it all done in 45 minutes and put everything back and made it to recess. But my, there, there are elements of science we're constantly thinking of. How can we get, you know, and of course kids said, hey, we learned all about simple machines in fourth grade, you know, and so some of them were bringing that back. These were fifth graders at the time. That, that's what I was asking for. It's just okay. that, you know, that's, a, that's an example Constantly of the, you know, the, trying the explicit to connection, which I wasn't, yes. I didn't hear as part of the presentation. So thank you for right. that. That's You're what welcome. I was hoping to hear. You're welcome. Um, a few other questions. Um, just, and only because I don't remember and I didn't bring it with me. Um, on the district implementation technology plan, what was goal two? Assessment. That's no, an interesting there, piece. There was no component within assessment that's directly related to the innovative learning component. Uh, if you're going to give a longer answer, you need to really use the microphone. Here, do you want to That's okay. okay. I, knew, I knew someone was going to ask that question. Um, I was looking at the, um, what were the specific components within innovative learning that were within the technology plan on that? The assessment components weren't, I, I couldn't make the, the particular reach to that part. Um, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things, but the goals that were written in, in the 2015-2018 weren't directly linked to that. That's why I left it out. Okay. Um, on that same page, that feedback form is, n is something I was very happy to hear about but know nothing about. And I was wondering, how, how are parents being informed about that? Right. How do students know about that? What do you see as its use and purpose? So after going to the first open house realizing we we do need a feedback loop not just from the community but also from the students and the administrators and the teachers um, so we put that on the top right hand corner and i've um, talked to the um, uh, the library specialists and the technology integration teachers as well as the administration to say any feedback from um, not just what's not not to direct what do i do if 
but also, hey, this is a really awesome thing. So it's going back to a previous question of how are we starting to capture the narrative of what's really working and from a recommendation standpoint, what do we need work on? There's a space for direct questions on there. Uh, any question that the board has asked, we take a look at it, um, answer the question in um, pushing information back to the website. So some of it does stay internal from a procedural standpoint, but the rest is going back into what professional development can we do? How do we reflect uh, uh, increased student resources? So it does give an opportunity for the entire community to provide feedback. So if someone submits something on that feedback form, what, what's the, what are the steps? To whom is it going and then where does it go from there? I will get an email instantaneously that so-and-so is submitted such and such. Um, if it is a previously answered question, um, if someone wants a direct response back to that, they have an opportunity to, to put an email in there. Um, right now, it's, it is um, the predominant amount of, of questions have been um, between teachers asking specific things, some administrative um, questions that we then put back into uh, the website with directly answering, or we um, we approach it in a professional development um, environment. And but is this something that is going to be pushed out to parents through whatever, you know, PTA email, uh, daily bulletin? So, so that's a very good question. I'll be uh, working with uh, each individual um, principal and the PTAs to what um, additional workshops we can provide. But I mentioned the feedback form. I believe every uh, open house, with the exception of Fairfield um, Ward. So I, I did announce that at each of the open house. Okay. So we're we're, we're going to continue to advertise that feedback uh, link. Okay. Thank you. Um, Again, I just want to. I was very happy to hear all the things that you outlined about digital citizenship. I can't stress enough how much they won't hear you the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth time. So please keep at it because, of course, each individual is immune to any idea of a digital footprint until, until. Um, so, I guess. Um, I think the only other. Th um, the only thing I'll say now, I'll check to see if there are oh, two other uh, final questions, and I think I've, the rest of it I can hold on, um, is that I do hope that underlying all of the professional development is always with, with what goal? You know, that integration is being employed for what goal? Um, that it's always meant to be forward achieving, that this is bring, getting us to do something that otherwise we couldn't do, right. that is enriching the student experience, um, that is actually directed towards achievement, um, and that it's easy for that to fall off and just have it be you're learning how to do something and where is the time to turn that into something meaningful um, not to lecture you I just want to repeat how I important know it's important I already heard a thread of that and just to say you know please that's great and then the, I guess my last question I don't think I need to ask any of the others um, through the chair to Dr. Jones how do you see this as being and this might be ahead of the gun but long-term savings how do you see this impacting the 2019-20 budget not in terms of more machines, in terms of savings. Like what might this be enabling us to do so that we can do without blank? Yeah, I mean, I can only talk about my own past experience having gone through this. And um, we were asked this question at Board of Finance, and I gave them some examples. But you know, generally, your copier cost goes down, sometimes as much as between 40 and 60 percent, um, just depending on as teachers get more comfortable. Um, generally, your textbook cost actually starts to go down. Um, as you know, I mean, I was talking to um, Dr. Rasmussen and our, you know, online calculus textbook, just as an example, to get the book in the digital version is $250. Um, so if you start finding some of those open source resources, um, especially in areas like history, where the content is up to date, it's current, it's published by reputable universities, a lot of your history teachers will start gravitating in that direction because the, the books are quickly out of date. Um, so there are lots of cost savings, I think, in that direction, just in, in resources. Um, and and the devices themselves, you know, we these devices we have an outstanding price point on them. The device is about $179 plus the license, I believe, 204. Um, and that you compare that to an HP that we were literally 12, 16, 18 months ago, we're paying five, five, five fifty. So you know, it's you're getting almost three devices to one. So that that piece will keep 
as we enhance technology, it keeps your technology budget from going wild and crazy also. Um, the carts themselves, not having to buy carts, they're very expensive. Um, and when you change your units, uh, when the units upgrade, sometimes you also have to change your carts depending on how they charge. So there's a lot of ancillary costs that go along with that other model. Um, so those are just a few. So if this can factor into, I'll give three months warning, um, yeah. you know, that to prepare that it, if it's appropriate and if it's something that you can put your finger on, mm -hmm. that I would love to hear as part of the January budget presentation. Right. This, and I don't think we're saving millions by having this. It right, wasn't right. the goal of rolling out the initiative at all. But anything that can be pointed to, I'd be interested in hearing about. Absolutely. And we're working on something that would look at total cost of ownership. Yeah. Ms. Jacobson. I'm glad that you mentioned textbooks. It starts with one of my questions um, going forward. I had read the um, technology plan recently. And inside of that technology plan, it states that you are no longer or recommending that we buy any textbooks going forward. Is that accurate? I think I would defer to Dr. Jones on that, but I think... Well, it's in the technology plan, so I was just... That would predate me, but that would not be. My philosophy on it is um, when students are ready and they no longer want a textbook, then don't buy it for them where they drive around with it in their car. Um, but if, at the point that teachers still feel like they need it as a resource, uh, the students are utilizing them, then I, I think that's a slow kind of phase out. You'll find in areas generally... Um, like math, for instance, they tend to be a little bit slower just because the content's all right there. Um, but again, I, we'll, we will take that from our teachers and they're going to lead us on that. And if they feel like they need a textbook, but it's kind of like, even if, as you know, next generation science standards, we haven't been able to find really textbooks anymore. So the market may also drive our teachers in certain directions over the next five years on what's available. I think I would add that having the historical reference for the building of that plan three years ago, um, that the idea was to use the online version of the textbook. Right. So it's still a textbook that's just digitally prepared, um, knowing that we would have some students that would still need hard copies for a variety of reasons, as I think Dr. Jones alluded to. The other thing that we really had wanted to embrace and uh, um, we're kind of working on that, but we're trying to also balance that with the Privacy Act, um, is using open educational resources. There's a, a whole federal government program for that, that um, Connecticut started with higher ed. We're waiting for it to kind of trickle down to us. But meanwhile, we're kind of doing our own thing with the curriculum leaders and identifying those resources. As Dr. Jones said, um, social studies is a good example, or history. Um, that curriculum is built on a lot of online resources. Um, so and, 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 textbook and databases, companies, yeah. and textbook companies have really changed their approach because if you go back to 2009, 2010, when a lot of people thought they were going to go really with digital textbooks, not because it was the best thing for students, because it was cheap. And the, when they first came out, you could buy the online for $35 and you were still paying 100 plus for a hard copy book. Once they figured out that, that we're, they were going to lose money with that model, that's no longer the case. You either buy them together, and if you buy the hard copy, then you also get the digital, um, or you're paying not that much less, really, for a digital. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't an urgency like there was when people were just thinking of it from a monetary standpoint. I, okay and, and I understand what you were saying from the technology plan that was intended to buy the online version and understand where we're going with the open resources. The only question, reason why I asked that was that we statutorily are required to approve textbooks and educational okay. materials. So I was just curious how, as this goes forward, how are we going to follow that law? If it's a textbook, it would come before the board. If it's an educational resource yeah. that a teacher uses, uh, that is we, which we've used for you know 50 years, um, that would not come before the board. If a teacher wants, it could be an individual teacher. It could be a team of teachers that have a resource they really want to use. Mm -hmm. um, that would not come before the board. They never have. Okay. Um, my second question, thank you, sorry for that. Um, my second question was, is our, um, on our website, our third party vendor list up to date and current as of today? Um, it's very current. Um, I think I have a couple of dates I still need to update because, frankly, I've been processing privacy addendum agreements. Um, Tom can, Tom and Dr. Jones, who's, I think, Good. 
I think she's getting uh, writer's cramp for signing her name off. Um, but we're, we're really close if we're not 100 percent. We've had some really um, wonderful additions to the list. Um, I have to give a shout out to Doug Casey, who's on the Commission for Educational Technology, for working with some of the vendors who, when we initially started this a couple of years ago, refused to sign off. Um, recently, Code.org is one, as well as Khan Academy. Um, so we're really thrilled that you know they've agreed to comply with the terms, and um, our district has already made arrangements with them and signed off. So that's great. Yeah. That was the goal. All right. Thank you. Other comments, Mrs. Vitali. Um, this is really for Dr. Jones. Just the director of digital learning. That's a new position in the district. Can you just speak to that? Um, how you see the role evolving right now? I mean, he hit the ground running with this initiative. How he works with other departments, who reports to him, just to get an idea of that position. Yeah, he is. When um, welcome. Yeah, he is part of that. We've added really the instructional piece to the infrastructure aspect of the department, so that you have somebody that's out looking sim solely, really, at that instructional from the instructional lens, looking at professional development. What are the parent workshops um, that we're going to be offering? What is the instructional model as he's working with um, the district team? They're putting together a new, um, I want to say. Um, technology committee but I don't remember what it's going to be called which will be much more I'm going to say more expansive where more teachers are at the table because we have more devices out there with the teachers getting more of their voices um, and it's really making sure every decision we make from a technology standpoint is there's somebody that's instructional that's right there reaching back out which really is essential um, and it's something that I think I've heard from the district that we that we needed um, was to have that piece and it really answers a lot of these questions when you're looking at online resources for textbooks and it's difficult for a Mr. Cummings or Mr. Arnone to carry that piece. It is a full-time job. Um, just the rollout alone. I spent a lot of time last spring at the very end of the year at the table with this group as a school superintendent, which I love, um, but having somebody that I know is there um, that from the district perspective knows the budget, you know, comes from the instructional lens, is there at the table with the infrastructure people makes all the difference in the world. So his role would be really to have consistency among instruction as new resources are identified. Because I'm hearing this, and a lot of it depends on how comfortable a teacher is. So I'm wondering if you know, one teacher may be very proficient and may be accessing all of these wonderful resources, and another teacher teaching the exact same class may not be doing the same thing, which is concerning um, just because you want to have some sort of. Well, I think, it, to be honest with you, that's, that's the um that's the challenge of great education. You know, in the old days, you could go in one classroom and a teacher had manipulatives everywhere with third graders, and another teacher was still stuck in the workbook mode, and everybody was in rows. And through the years, we all kind of grow and change. And I digit, you know, and doing this digitally is no different. And it goes back to what I said before: some teachers are going to start at the substitution level. That's not where we want them to stay. We want to help them grow. But somebody has to be there, planning the professional development, making sure. There's somebody at the table when we have our instructional meetings fighting for the professional development time for technology because it's such competing interests with special education needs training and technology needs training and content teachers need training. So um, it's really, it comes back again to making the instructional component of technology really important. Okay, switching gears a little bit. Just um, the financing for this round, this purchase. I have a memo that I guess went to, to you from Nancy Burns. 235460 in the technology capital account for 2017-2018 for replacement of aging devices. Are we just shifting the type of devices we're now replacing? That's probably an easy way to say yes, yes. Where it's appropriate, yes, that's exactly what we've done. Do you foresee revising the technology plan? We are in the process of starting it. 2018 is the end of our plan. So for this budget season, we'll be working with the new steering committee that Dr. Jones just talked about um, to identify what we want to accomplish over the next three years. OK, and these are just more, um, they've been out in Ludlow. Have there been any problems, any, anything lost, anything broken yet? 
I think we had one device that was stolen. We've had roughly, um, as far as those that have come up to central office, so in other words, the building technicians or the library media specialists and the tech integrators haven't been able to resolve the issues because sometimes it's an easy fix. Um, central office has roughly handled 60 of the um, 4,000 devices that are in circulation. Um, 29 of them have gone out for repair um, and are in either back or, you know, going to be coming back in a couple of days. Our rough turnaround is about three days with the manufacturer's warranty. Do you have an idea of how many kids have opted out? We're having kids opt in, so the opt out piece is a dynamic component. I do not have the final numbers because it, we're still just finished the deployment. We're going to circle back with the individuals um, at each building and kind of get a general idea of what our opt out numbers are. Middle school was, was not. Option, but for high school, and I asked as a high school parent who, um, and I will say, the Chromebook has not left my house because my daughter's a senior and she's always just had her computer. And I'm wondering if I should be pushing her to return it <laughs> um, or waiting for her to maybe just decide to take it to school instead. Um, so there's a personal little anecdotal just, um, you know, as a board member, I'm, it kills me because it doesn't seem fiscally responsible for it to be sitting in my house. Um, and I think that there's probably some other seniors are in the same boat and I'm kind of curious if we are seeing um, a higher number that need to be replaced or repaired and if there is a shortage if there's any going to be any kind of push to kind of maybe revisit that I understand wanting everybody to use it mm -hmm. and it is faster um, in terms of accessing it but something just to keep in mind thank you yeah, I'm done. any other questions from board members Again, uh, thank you for the initiative that you've shown in the district and for the service that you've always given as a professional staff to the district and to our students. Uh, the next item is adoption of policies. We have uh, two in front of us. Um, before I get the recommended motion, uh, the agenda says enclosure number one. Please note that at your table, at your table, there's a 1A enclosure. Um, there are two amendments that have been recommended. In one sense, they're competing amendments, uh, essentially on the issue of should um, there are three issues before the board. Uh, the policy that's in front of you does not provide for any community service requirement. So if you don't want to have any community service requirement, you vote no on both amendments. Uh, the one, uh, the first one that you'll consider would make it voluntary and have some hours required uh, in order to get that recognition. And the second one that Mr. Asa will present is mandatory, uh, not with credit, but uh, uh, and not with any seal on the uh, diploma, it's just a says that you have to have so many hours for the over the four years um, and so uh, Roberts rules says when there are two quote competing amendments the one that is the less intrusive to the original main motion should be considered first and that is why the voluntary one is considered first because it's less intrusive on the main motion with that as a description I will ask uh, I'll put the recommended motion on the table and then I'll go to Mrs. Maxon Canelli to uh, introduce it. Recommended motion that the Board of Education waive the, nope, uh, one up above that, that the Board of Education adopt policy 6146 requirements for graduation. Mrs. Maxon Canelli, seconded by Mr. Acer. Mrs. Maxon Canelli. Okay, so just briefly, again, uh, as a reminder to the board that we did bring this before you in June. Um, what drove this were some relatively significant uh, state statute changes, which policy took up um, in April after staff had been working a lot behind the scenes for months. Uh, we worked on it April through June. We brought it to, uh, in June, before the board for a first read. Um, decided at that time that we needed to take it back uh, to do some more work in policy rather than have the uh, board move ahead with it in the second meeting of June and try to grapple with language with the full board. So we've been working with it a couple of meetings now, uh, voted it out of policy last week uh, to bring before you um, for, it is a vote only because we'd brought it forward, uh, forward to you as a first read in June. 
Um, obviously, the, the policy committee has been working with it for months. So while we feel good about it, I very much defer to the feelings of the board of whether they're ready, uh, as you know, um, Mr. Twyer uh, referenced, you know, whether we vote on this tonight or whether you need more time or have more questions, especially if I can't answer the questions tonight. Um, so there's the full policy itself and then the specific amendments uh, regarding community service, which we in policy um, hashed out over a few meetings um, with a lot of ideas and ultimately we're not comfortable um, as a full policy committee putting into uh, the policy uh, the gradu as a graduation requirement, a lot of interest in it and more to the point we knew other board members not on the policy committee uh, were interested in it. Um, so we did give a heads up to those board members and thus you have the amendments uh, with you today. So I suppose it kind of first starts with an, an interest in what is the interest in community service because obviously if I, there's... Can I say first, um, can we have any questions that might come on the main graduation policy that's in front of you so that if there are questions on the main mm -hmm. uh, goal where people are not, uh, policy where people are not comfortable, well then that would say that the amendments will wait until we're ready to move on this. I'm hopeful that we're ready to move on the uh, the uh, goal of the policy, but that's up to the board, as Mrs. Maxson Canelli said. Questions on the main policy that is in front of you uh, for graduation requirements, Ms. Mitchell. I had a question that I brought up when we originally brought this up. That I have a uh, world language. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how the course selection will go. I know that for some special education students, world language, is, it seems to be a hurdle for the diploma. Do we know if that was brought up in a discussion? Very much. Um, so that that's one of the reasons why we don't want to, you know, it, I don't think it's any problem at all if we decided, if the other board members decided that you'd like to put this off to the second week of October. The reason we don't want this policy going out any beyond that is because staff does have a lot of work to do. One of it would be with how are we going to fulfill a world language requirement for students who are not um, on track to take a French or a Spanish. Um, Certainly the population which you reference, and I'm not saying that there is, aren't students beyond that, you know, w with other differing interests, but staff need, therefore needs time to put on their curriculum hats and look to perhaps create a new course. I don't think this would involve tweaking what we have. I do think it would end up being something new, and we did talk about that in policy, and that again is one of the, you know, is one impetus behind needing to move forward with this because staff has work to do once we pass this. Other questions on the main policy that's in front of you. L let me point out a couple of the changes from what you saw in June. One significant change is with the mastery half credit at the end. Uh, there had been some debate over the evidence-based reading and writing and the math and we did add in that third option um, where students can demonstrate mastery because again when we talk about college and career ready there's a uh, with common core there are a variety of ways that students can demonstrate mastery. So we put in that third option uh, under Roman numeral four, which is something that is significantly different. I mean, I don't think it's a, a game changer. Um, it does, however, I think speak to some things that board members had references, referenced as being interested in. Um, so that's one change from there. Um, there's also the explicit language regarding uh, under Roman numeral three regarding seventh and eighth grade students. Uh, that's coming from statute, but we uh, wanted to put that into policy um, as a means of educating parents about this as a possible option. Um, a few other changes. Uh, so that's in the second paragraph on page two under Roman numeral three. Uh, some of the uh, bullet points, well, they're not bullet points at this point, but some of the means of meeting those mastery credits um, have also been tweaked and adjusted. So again, those, those are a couple of the changes that we did from June. Uh, other questions on the main uh, policy that's in front of you? Um, is there anybody that says the policy committee is recommending that we take action on, on it tonight? Is there anybody that wishes to express that we should put this decision off? to another meeting. Uh, ask away, Mr. Asen. Okay. So under Roman numeral four, mastery-based diploma, so basically 
this this remain there. So with the PSAT, SAT, they can if they meet that requirement, they're done, right? Correct. Okay. They have to be both for reading and writing and mathematics. No, if you look right above where it says Roman numeral four, yeah, it says completion of one option in two out of the three sections. Oh, okay. So that's what's new. So if someone is math is not their Sorry, thing, I'm, they have I'm, two other ways that they can meet okay. this half credit requirement. And the um, so. They could do the PSAT or SAT and then um, competency based. I'm just I'm just wondering like where it says complete a capstone course um, versus a simple thing like that. I'm just trying to figure out like one is a tremendous amount of time and one is just and they meet different students' needs and okay. abilities. Uh, for example, that uh, completing a capstone course could be something that's constructed after a conversation in a PPT regarding meeting um, gotcha. the needs of special needs students. That could be something that would be the focus of that group if meeting passing the PSAT uh, proficiency score is looking like an arduous task gotcha. or not likely that this gives the staff flexibility to have other means for the student to demonstrate that mastery. Okay, thank you. Ms. Vitale. I'm really kind of speaking on behalf of Ms. Leeper. Um, I know that she had brought up an interest in financial literacy, and some other parents have also expressed that interest. But I understand that she either spoke to you or Mr. Cummings about possibly working it in to a health class or the health curriculum. Um, I just don't want that to be lost. Right. Well, one thing that uh, so Ms. Sleeper had brought up back in June, had reiterated uh, in email to me, uh, and then in follow up with her regarding financial literacy as a topic. Certainly not a topic that I think anyone is interested in our students not being educated in, um, but understanding that by mandating, if we were to mandate it, the FTE impact of that, um, also further moving away from what was supposed to be the spirit of the state statute, which is, you know, pursuing individual interests more degree that you know not quite mandating each step that they take um, but really especially that FTE impact uh, I know was one significant part of the conversation and also once she um, saw the high school the program of studies saw what the description of the course was to realize that we do in fact ha offer a course at this time um, that is available to students to take uh, so I think all of that helped to um, allay her concerns that it wasn't a graduation requirement, but through the chair to Mr. Cummings, did I miss any part of that conversation? I don't know if you thought you were going to escape with not coming up, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, good evening, Mike Cummings, Chief Academic Officer. No, I think you've you've captured the conversation. We did talk uh, when Ms. Lieber and I spoke. We. We, talk about, we talked about the fact that that cur course does currently exist. We also talked about um, how, how a course, in general, how a course can become more desirable to students, and perhaps that was the best way to approach this issue. It, well, uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli is conferring. About two or three years ago, I forget when exactly, um, the business staff came to us and talked about uh, the registration of their classes, which had a tremendous growth pattern in it that, that my recollection was either two or three times what it used to be. So uh, I think our students are recognizing that financial literacy is important to them simply by their own decision making around uh, registering for classes. Well, I do remember that class, and I think that was more of a math focus. And I, is health being reviewed right now, that curriculum? The health curriculum is on the docket to be reviewed uh, next year, the 1920 school year. They have started the process. Can I really just bring it up for open house in health class where, as part of the health curriculum, a budget is, the kids are given a budget, you have $40,000 a year, you have to do this, 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 and this. What do you do if you run out of money? And the idea of a credit card and opening up a credit card and credit card debt and all that very real life problem that I think many um, college graduates face themselves with. I'm not really sure if that was part of the financial literacy class, but it's a very real life lesson that I think that children, that, students that maybe wouldn't be taking a financial literacy course from the math business perspective still need to be taught. And 
Ideally, they'd be taught at home, but I think that just preparing um, our kids to be adults, it might be um, something to keep in mind as we look forward to the health curriculum. But I'm not just putting it out there just because it was a discussion point, I didn't want it to get lost being the misleader wasn't here, but not to stand in the way of this policy. Any other questions on the main uh, policy? I'm uh, taking from your silence that you are ready to act on the policy tonight, so shall we move on to the amendments at the moment? Um, I, one thing, I, uh, Mr. Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm fumbling with my uh, policy partner here. I couldn't yell over to Mrs. Jacobson. Um, but we do have two other language issues here that one of which came up two hours ago that the policy committee was not aware of and which we're either going to have to adjust on the fly right now um, or do in pull it back to policy and bring it back for a vote. And I'll explain on page one, actually, well, I'll reference it and Mr. Cummings Please tell me if I mischaracterize it. Absolutely. Uh, literally, this was two hours ago as I was walking out of executive session to come here. We've discovered that uh, Mr. Cummings was told by uh, someone in IT that our old way of doing credits, which is what you're seeing here, which is why these numbers look so much bigger, uh, where we did one credit per semester, and we are switching to what's called the Carnegie units, where it's a half a credit per semester, that we cannot simultaneously do both in infinite campus and this we found out two out well staff found out two hours or found out this afternoon I found out two hours ago so we're, this is all going to have to be redone and I apologize to um, the chair that I could not give you more advanced wording than this but essentially we have a choice of fixing this right now what, what is the fix we're gonna have to change all the numbers Four. and I'm not saying or, we, or we, we have policy meeting next week. We adjust the numbers, and I, this is not going to take long, but they do have to be. Okay, but, okay. but can I ask, just before we uh, defer this yet again, yeah. uh, are we talking about it's a mathematical formula, each of these numbers has gets to be? Gets cut in half. Gets cut in half. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's just the making the motion, yeah, It's just a mathematical formula. Yes. That's all it is. So would the board be willing to say, uh, we'll adopt the policy amended to have each of the credits listed uh, cut in half per. Um, I, I, I just want to make you aware like it's it's one or the other. Either we we Which, fix it. What is the it board's back. preference, Mrs. Gerber? Well, just to clarify, that is all that is. So it would be eight is four, six is three, seven is three point five. That's all it is. There's nothing more complicated than that. It, it's literally having it's, it's all of these numbers. Yeah, that's all it is. It's simply to make sure that in when students in who in a classroom of say next let's play out a year in an elective area tech ed class for example there are both freshmen who would be graduating under the 2023 requirements and, it, and I say a senior who would be graduating under the 2020 requirement um, what would happen if we did not fix this is we would essentially have to have in all those classes two different class rosters which would mean teachers would have to enter assignments twice if we if we without essentially take the existing credits in half, we can put them all in one. Without going into the administrative details yeah. of it, the answer to the question is yes. Each of these numbers L is just in half. In half. And yeah. just page one, or also page two. Page two. So every single number page in this. Oh, page just one. Page two is just fine. Page one. Okay, I just yeah. want to clarify. Okay, just, just so page the one. only thing that has to be changed are all of the numbers on page one. They all need to be cut in half. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yes. So with that as a clarification, would the board be a amenable to an amendment that said well, pass this let me just state what it, the question is um, uh, that the board would be amenable to an amendment that says uh, the, all the numbers on page one shall be cut in half etc um, uh, mr. Acer you want to make a comment well no I have a question so what about the 43 that would be 21.5 and the last sentence of the opening paragraph um, and the same on the paragraph beneath would have to be one semester equals 0.5 credit so 21.5 and okay so um, I have one more que question because I'm just curious out of curiosity these these credits right here don't equal 43 so what's the difference electives correct mr. Cummings that is correct yeah. okay and when you say don't equal 23 the new number will be 43 I said 43, 43. So it will mean half of them won't 1. equal 21.5 Ms. Jacobson, did you have a comment that you wanted to make or a question? Yeah. We got it. We got it. 
No, okay. Uh, you said there were, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Yep. You said there were two changes, that's one? Yes. Would you agree with that wording? Master based content experience, just shortening that? Yes. Okay, the other one was a miss, um, and I have no other fancy way to put it. Um, is uh, at the bottom of page D. Page D? We had long approved oh, this section and so did not take this one we just missed, and I caught it coming into here. <coughs> Under notification, where it says, by August before the start of senior year, the guidance department will formally notify students, their teachers, and parents or guardians if the district standards has not been met in the areas of that language to the end of the sentence would need to be amended, um, and that's because we'd added the content to area mastery. It would need to be amended to the areas of mastery-based content experiences. Because it is no longer just math or evidence-based reading and writing. There are now three options in there. So if I can say it this way, that the uh, words mathematics through writing correct would be struck correct and replaced with areas of mastery based experiences content Co mastery based, based content experiences content experiences okay so with an amendment for those two changes would the board be comfortable with acting on this policy once that amendment is uh, adopted yes or no Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, correct me if I'm wrong, that if we had a single amendment that said uh, move to amend uh, policy 6146 uh, to reflect the numbers of credits on page one. Page A. Page A uh, shall be cut in half. Uh, and on page D, um, the uh, phrase on the third line will read, uh, striking out mathematics of evidence-based reading and writing to be replaced with areas of mastery-based content experiences. Correct, and I would make that. You would make that motion. I'll sec uh, Mr. Peterson will second it. Uh, any questions or comments on that amendment? Having none, uh, out to the public. Does the public have any comments on the amendment that we just discussed? Hopefully you followed it in some <laughs> fashion. I see no member of the public coming forward, so therefore back to the board with no final comments. Um, all in favor of that amendment, please raise your hand. It is unanimous, thank you very much. So now on to the amendment. Thank you very much for bringing those uh, changes to our attention. Um, so now the uh, first amendment I would ask Mrs. Jacobson to present that amendment reminding the board that if you like community service uh, but feel it should be mandatory then you would not vote in favor of this and you'd wait for the second one. If you like community service and would prefer it to be voluntary you would support this one and not the second one. Or if you don't, don't like community any community <laughs> service vote them both down. So having said that, to just remind you of where we are, Mrs. Jacobson. I just want to start by saying I'm so excited I get to be the less intrusive person today. <laughs> I, I just, thanks Robert's rules. Um, okay, so. So first you should introduce okay. the motion. Okay. So I'm introducing a motion. I think everyone has a copy of it in front of them. Um, it is a proposed amendment under Section 5 of the graduation policy um, under the area of additional considerations. So under Section 5, it would become an additional consideration in addition to the ones that you're already in the policy under Section 5. So is everyone with me so far? Okay, but it's a long uh, amendment, so if yes. the board will, with unanimous consent, waive the reading Thank you. of this amendment. It's in front of you, and so uh, you need to move the amendment, and we need a second, and then you should make your points. Okay, I move to propose an amendment to Section 5 under additional credits, uh, considerations of the graduation policy, 6146. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? 
I would just suggest to say um, uh, amend Section 5 additional considerations of the draft graduation policy as referenced in Enclosure 1A. I oh, think that okay. would just be simpler because then we have 1A in front okay. of us. Okay. What she said. Okay. With that motion, Mrs. Gerber is seconded. Please uh, present. Okay. Um, when we were talking about graduation requirements, it became through the months. Um, suggested that perhaps the board would be interested in including a community service requirement into the policy or that some members were interested in doing that. Um, I have to say in, in presenting this amendment, um, it was definitely something that we talked a lot about in committee. Um, and I think that there's a strong commitment to community service in general um, from members. However, there were some <laughs> members that were concerned concerned about making it a mandate within the graduation policy for their own for several reasons so in discussions about this I had thought of uh, the state option that we have at, in state law called the seal of biliteracy that is an option that students can earn when they upon their transcript when they earn the requisite requirements to earn such designation by the state and so in that that came to my mind in creating a designation, the Fairfield Board of Education designation of community service in recognition of students who do um, service within the community up to a requisite numbers of hours and making that a real part of this board, a real part of our graduation ceremony, a real part of their transcript. Um, I feel, you know, besides obviously the wording that is in the enclosure that I've included, um, I have done some research of my own into just looking at the value of community service as a mandatory or voluntary option where it seems to be most successful and I also was in, um, concerned that the state statute as itself already provides for a community service requirement that is for credit that is tied to curriculum that has reflection pieces to it um, so that was also another option that the committee did not go forward because it would require significant staff time to track such like 180,000 hours of community service hours over a four-year cohort which we thought would be really difficult for our schools to be able to handle um, but really I was just proposed this amendment as a voluntary option to hopefully build a bridge between those of us that had concerned about making this an additional mandate to our students on top of the additional credits on top of everything else that they have going on in their lives and for me personally some students that may have challenges in fulfilling this in terms of perhaps special needs requirements that maybe make it difficult which we know can be written out of the IETP process or those who may have to work after school take care of younger siblings and just being conscious of all of our students being able to um, not only meet these additional credit requirements but everything else that they have they going on in their lives so um, it was really just a bridge idea between the two um, and that's why I proposed it um, because both amendments have to be considered one than the other uh, and uh, Mrs. Jacobson clearly was talking about here's why voluntary because I don't like mandatory for good just reasons uh, Mr. Acer if you wanted to talk about w why mandatory made sense to you you'd be of course welcome to do that so that both arguments are on the table uh, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly did you have your hand no Mr. Peterson who had well, your I, hand up I, I did I okay. but I would, if I could follow Mr. Asa or actually no, I, I would like to put just something out explicitly because I have my own arguments about this. I just want to be very um, specific about this um, to Mrs. Gerber, to Mrs. Vitalian, to Ms. Pico. Um, this is really where no one has heard from the three of you. Uh, having been in policy, I know well Mr. Peterson and Mrs. Jacobs' position. Having received the amendment um, regarding the non-credit uh, graduation requirement, I'm well aware of where Mr. Dwyer and Mr. Asa sit. So just to be really clear, um, I obviously our, most of our comments then are directed to the three of you um, and wondering where your position is on this because that's going to determine how this direction goes. Not to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to be really clear about that. Uh, well, in all fairness, we don't know where you all stand. Well, I you just stated it. In, in, in all honesty, you don't, you, you, I mean, we can, I'm not going to speak for anyone uh, besides myself, but you don't actually have to know where we stand. If the three of you are all very but much in favor of one, it's one direction, in favor of aren't another. Aren't we just discussing another. the motion it, on the table? Yeah, I think it is fair that uh, um, Ms. Jacobson and Mrs. Or did you just second it for the purpose of discussion? I second it because I support it. Yeah, okay. So we have two that support voluntary. Clearly, we have two that support mandatory I don't know whether 
the debate that happened in policy I just clarify. If I could just be specific, kind of what, what Ms. Canelli was getting to. Two of us in the three-person policy committee didn't favor a, a mandatory requirement, but we mm -hmm. realized that other people on the board did, and this was the cludge that we did to make sure that we heard everyone's voices. Yeah. Uh, you know, both uh, you know, Mrs. Ms. Jacobson and I agreed that this would be the best the best way, understanding that our m opinion in that minority committee shouldn't prevail over the voice of the whole board. And Mrs. McIntyre, I was in favor of the non-credit requirement, the mandatory. Correct. Okay, sorry. Does that help, Ms. Pitko, to say? To, to answer your question, we don't know where the, I think. Now you do. Yeah. Now you do. Yeah. Okay. Are you gonna, is it, Does anyone well, have any questions on the motion? <laughs> now, uh, I he, he, he can, but I think uh, Mrs. Maxson Kelly was asking where others stand so that we might know where we stand. But Mr. Acer, you don't have to comment if you don't want to. Mr. Acer. So uh, I'm not really going to go on and on about this because I brought it up uh, a meeting or two ago or whenever it was when we, when we talked about this. Um, I felt passionate that a mandatory requirement for community service um, be in place um, for, for the, the value of it, the, the life experience and everything that goes along with it, and, and my own personal experiences. Um, at that point, Mr. Dwyer and I met with Dr. Jones um, and discussed how we would potentially present this and, and go about it and some options. Um, came up with pretty much what's in front of you today um, and with the hopes that if the, if the majority of the board felt it, you know, um, positive about it, that it would pass. But, you know, understanding um, the, the pros and cons and the, and the cons for me being really um, what Mrs. Jacobson said um, you know existing requirements and workloads um, and, and everything that a uh, high school student already has to do um, I still feel passionate about it and I still think it's something that which equates to about a half hour a week of the school year um, if you if you divide it over the number of weeks and, and years and whatnot um, but I also understand that I don't have a child in high school I am not a high school parent I have a kindergartner <laughs> so I am very much in favor of hearing from the three other board members uh, on that side of the table and see where they weigh in um, because I have some uh, thoughts about this and why it's important but I also don't want to discount the concerns that others have so I would say that I do feel and I think Mr. Dwyer and I are on the same page on this um, and it's something that has been done in other districts um, so I would like to uh, do it here but I, I would, as Mrs. Maxson Canelli says, I would love to hear from the three of you on your opinions. Because essentially we're three and three. Mrs. Gerber. Okay, well, I uh, seconded Mrs. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Jacobson's um, amendment because I support it. Um, I wholeheartedly support uh, the idea of community service. Um, I'm in year seven as being a high school parent, and my children have done community service in school, out of school. Um, but I just am concerned when every year we have uh, presentations done about stress of high school students. Um, they have too many requirements. They have too much on their plates. Um, when you have after school activities, when you have sports, when you have jobs, when you have other responsibilities, I'm just leery of the idea of making it a requirement. I understand that the amount seems relatively small, but sometimes those amounts can end up feeling like they're a lot bigger than they are. So I liked Mrs. Um, Jacobson's amendment because I feel that it um, gives students the opportunity to participate in community service and be recognized for it, which I think is very important, um, but it doesn't make it a requirement. And I would also just say that I, I do know at the high school level with National Honor Society, they changed the um, the grade point average requirement for a National Honor Society students, in part, my understanding is at least, because there were uh, concerns about finding enough volunteer opportunities for the students in National Honor Society, so raising the grade point average would reduce the number of students in Honor Society. So 
if we're talking about only part of the high school community um, having trouble finding community outlets for those students to do that kind of work, I would just be concerned about having 3,000 students a year having to have this community service requirement. Um, so that's why I support Mrs. Uh, Jacobson's amendment, and uh, I will vote in favor of it. Um, um, so really, we're down to the, it's, it, you know, a, a week or so ago, we had a similar national discussion. There was a lot of focus on four or five people. Now it's the focus on two. Mrs. Vitale. I support Mr. Asa's um, amendment. I think many of our students do already do um, community service. I don't think it'll be hard for them to. I think that part of our mission is to raise global citizens. And I think that to be a citizen, you should, be give, you should make the time in your busy schedule to give back to the community. I don't think, I have a child, I have two high, one went through high school, very involved in service in college. I have one applying to college. Anyone who's going through that process, we hear so much about how schools or colleges are looking for students that are going to get involved in their communities there, both in the school, in the city, or town that their college is in. So I think there's some sort of a, um, a need for those that the college application process is everything. There is a piece of that. Um, and just even more in attending the vision of the graduate and hearing what parents wanted for their children. They wanted parents, they wanted their kids to be resilient. They wanted their parent, their kids to be, I have the list, you know, flexible, adaptable. They want to take initiative, personal responsibility, um, grit, ability to fail, empathy, compassion, kindness. All of those things you gain through giving back to the community. I have a child with special needs who has made sandwiches to give to Operation Hope. So I don't think that that necessarily is something that should stand in the way of community service. And in a way, I think it actually um, could be a wonderful avenue for those students to be self-advocates and to give back. A uh, half hour a week, it's not a lot. Um, and I think that's important. And I think that we should, as a Board of Ed, kind of support that. And I th one more. In terms of the stress, I think sometimes you learn resiliency and you learn a lot about yourself by being outside of your comfort zone and working with some that maybe are not as fortunate as you are. You learn a lot about yourself that you can't necessarily learn in the classroom and we should be supporting that. Ms. Pitko. I have one question before I weigh in on my idea. Was Mrs. Leeper given a chance to weigh in on this before this meeting? Mrs. Leeper had, to, this is kind of, talk about not helpful, had told me she was interested in community service. I, I just that, find it that, interesting because it. it's yeah. not the first time I'm hearing about it, but it's the first time I'm hearing your sides of it. And so I'm a little taken off guard, not going to lie, and that five people have already had these conversations. I ran a community fair in one of my school districts for nine years. I fully understand the point of getting our students involved in their community and donating their time. One of my first jobs was working for the American Red Cross right here in Bridgeport. However, it should not be mandatory. They have enough on their plates and they need to worry about post-secondary. So I can, I, uh, can, I, can, I, can, can I make a suggestion? Unless there are board members who are going to change their minds, it seems as though we have four to four. Is that a, if I, if, have I accurately understood that? And so the- Take a, Can I please? I have a question. Please go ahead. To um, Dr. Jones, I just wanted to make clear on both of these amendments that the district has no intention does, um, of having any infrastructure in place to support students in finding, locating, um, or engaging in any process whatsoever to support this experience from a district perspective, correct? No, not necessarily. Um, nobody's asked me that, really. But I, if well, you told me in policy you weren't going to have any FTE. You no, weren't we going to be. We don't. But I, I can say I, I do believe, and I have said this, that I, I think what we're trying to emulate is community action service, which is part of an international baccalaureate type program. I think if you're going to do something, then you should do it right. Mm -hmm. So we're either, because if you're saying it's mandatory and it's part of their graduation requirements and it's going on their transcript, I'm a, I'm a little uncomfortable in just saying, 
write down your 60 hours. We're just going to, going to accept it. That's what we have to do right. because we don't have the FTE, you know, to call and check placements and and do all of that. And I I think it is valuable for students. Um, but I, but that piece, I think, if it was mandatory, uh, it would be my recommendation during the budget that we look at how are we going to support that with staff because we can't have psychologists, counselors, or doing that that piece. All right, and just a quick follow up to our two headmasters. I was just wondering if they anticipate, and since they're sitting here, sorry to bother you guys. Any 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 preference or any obstacles yeah. that you see? on either one of these amendments. Sorry to pull you into the debate, but I think it's probably important to hear from our headmasters in terms of any impact this may have for either staff or students. Thanks for inviting us to the table. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, David and I haven't had a, a full chance to discuss this in detail, but I think we are of like mind. Um, we also very much see the value of community service and how it can really transform a young person into having a more global vision about understanding their community more and there are so many benefits. I think what um, a, a requirement of some kind would create is a conundrum of, of accountability for us. As Dr. Jones mentioned, um, you know, right now when a student is not meeting our current graduation requirements, which are based mostly on the academic piece, um, we pull out all the stops. We do everything we can to support those children. Um, we identify them early. Um, you know, we use a number of, of different measures and metrics to, to really track our students who might not be heading toward the right, uh, right path. Um, and sometimes students, because of a personal tragedy or something else, might have, you know, might have a really difficult senior year and put them out of balance a little bit. So we pull out all the stops and I have to tell you that even for a handful of students that takes a tremendous amount of effort. If there was a requirement for community service and a student wasn't meeting that requisite number of hours, I guess my question is would the board be prepared to say that a student is unable to graduate because they did not meet the requirement of the number of hours for community service? Like in the academic case, we would do whatever we could, but as Dr. Jones says, to then take away the time of focusing on their academics, and then remember our counselors not only focus on seniors, but they're working with the, the issues of the juniors, sophomores, and freshmen because they all have the different classes. So with the developmental guidance program, something would be lost for focusing on vetting the hours, making sure the students had opportunities, as a quick aside, I just was recently was on a NIESC visit of another district that did have a community service requirement. And so I had an opportunity to ask some of the students, um, you know, how that went for them. And uh, there was, I was a group, and one group of students that were a lot of the high achievers, and what they identified was, well, yeah, you know, that's just something we, we take care of in our sophomore year because that's what they suggest. And so, you know, we, you know, we, we get it done because we're too busy as juniors and seniors. And for another, another group of students who may not have been in that same track, they were still wondering how they were going to get it, but they weren't worried because it said somewhere in the program of studies that the guidance counselor will help them find the placement for, to get that done. So I think they had some stock location you know, uh, places that really wasn't about the student choice um, and the connection. It was really about the fulfillment of it. Um, so. I was a little disheartened by some of, those, some of that feedback because, you know, I do see th the value in it. I think one thing that we can really look at is um, ways for students to record what their, what their community service is in a more formal way, maybe through Naviance or some other programs, and they have that record of their personal experiences. Um, but I guess what I'll go back to is the question is my, my concern, or I think our concern has a lot to do with accountability. <laughs> Ebling. So, David Ebling, Headmaster of Fairfair Ward, I'll be a little more succinct uh, than Mr. Hatzis, but um, it, beyond just the accountability, because I think that would be a challenge for us, um, I think we have students that pursue passions in many different areas, and some of those do not include community service. So we have three season sport athletes. We have students that are very involved, for instance, in our music program. We have students that might be taking uh, an art class on the weekends outside of school or in the evenings. Uh, those are passions, too, that I think they pursue that aren't necessarily directed 
connected to community service. So I think it would be a challenge for students. We also have students who are working uh, 20 or 30 hours a week. And for them to try to find an additional area of work in community service would be a challenge also. Thank you. This is Max and Pinelli, followed by Ms. Pitko. Um, well, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm very glad that Mr. Hatzis had as much to say as he did, because it allowed me to calm down a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, before you leave, gentlemen, um, through the chair to our two headmasters, are you telling me that no one from central office asked you about this requirement at any point in time? No, we've had some discussion, but again, you know, not being privy necessarily to the final direction of where the policy was going to land, you know, we didn't have something specific to react to other than the prospect of a requirement um, as part of the part of the discussion. Well, so it definitely has come up. Okay, well, uh, through the chair to you, I can tell you in all honesty and complete faith, uh, your words were never communicated to the policy committee. No one on policy had any idea that any one administrative leadership had an objection to this. And through the chair to Dr. Jones, did you not have Dr. Puglesi in the meeting where he fully endorsed having community services part of this, said this was perfectly in line with the civic engagement requirement that we're rolling out as part of the vision of the graduate and that this would have no FTE implications? He was absolutely in the meeting with Mr. Dwyer and also Mr. Asa, who very much support community service. Is that my viewpoint? No, my viewpoint is to make, I was asked, would this have FTE implications? And did you Just say now. in policy committee on three different occasions Mrs. that Maxine, there would be no, no FTE implication? No I, no, I actually did not. And I actually said to the policy committee, I believe this is going to be very difficult for us to implement. And I gave the IB, International Baccalaureate, example several times. And I still stand by that. And I know that there's a difference of opinion. Mr. Dwyer and I have discussed that. He has said where he did it in Rye, New York, it didn't require FTE. I do believe that it's going to be a challenge for us without having some sort of plan to keep up with the hours for 3,000 students. And what was communicated to policy was that Dr. Puglesi believed not only was this fully able to be done with our current staff, but that this could be a simple measure of having students have a form that would be part of administrative regs that would be filled out and brought to guidance staff to be maintained in a file, that there would be no FTE implications beyond that, that there would be tremendous latitude given for the way that this community service could be rolled out, that in policy our final words walking out of there was that this would not be at an IB level, that there would be no FTE implication, no part of any budget discussion. Well, let me apologize because I wasn't there for the last 25 minutes, 30 minutes of the policy committee. So I'm not sure where you ended up last week when this was actually rolled out. But what I will say is I don't, I think it would be a stretch to say Mr. Puglis started talking about FTE. I don't think he sees that as his role and I don't think that he actually gave us that implication. What he did say, he does believe that through the, his actual civics, social studies curriculum, there are lots of opportunities where students could meet some of this through autism authentic engagement but again I can say that when I discussed that with Mr. Dwyer and Mr. Asa they weren't necessarily in, in support of that as much as they were community service outside of schools so there have been lots of different discussions I think what we're getting into right now is the regulation aspect of whatever this board decides to do we're going to make it work but if you're going to ask me can we make it work with zero FTE I can't tell you that tonight because we have a lot of work to do to be able to implement this policy and do it right so I just want to make that clear and I think that's what you're hearing from the headmasters tonight uh, just as among our board we have different viewpoints I'm sure there are different viewpoints among the staff as well um, having said that uh, where does the board want to um, we have one amendment on the table uh, if based on this discussion that we've had including from the headmasters if you say we're um, we're not interested in either voluntary or mandatory at this point uh, then you would um, move to postpone this amendment indefinitely that's the f way to quote kill an idea it's just postponed indefinitely until there's another uh, approach to how to uh, t attack tackle this or we could postpone this amendment to the next available meeting when we have nine members here 
Uh, that that's those I think some options that you have. Uh, Mr. Peterson, did you have your hand up? No, no. I was going to suggest that uh, I was going to make sure that there was kind of a, a, a path for us to wait on just the amendment. Yeah, there for is. For the next meeting. Yeah. That's, that's, the, what and that's, the, that's the path. Ms. Bitko, followed by Mr. Asif. Okay. My understanding is the amendment that Jen Jacobson has put forward is not that it's mandatory, but that they get recognition yes. for any service that they do. Correct. My biggest concern with making it mandatory for students is also the responsibility we would be putting on the guidance counselors one more task to keep track of this because there really would be no way to authenticate 3,000 students saying they did 40, 50, 60 hours of community service unless we hired someone else to do it. So truthfully, I would be in favor of Mrs. Jacobson's amendment because I do want to give recognition to any student who does any community service I just don't think it should be mandatory. Uh, um, so can I ask again, based on the discussion, has anybody who thought it should be voluntary switched to mandatory or anybody that thought it should be mandatory switched to voluntary, where we would break the 4-4 vote that we have? Seeing, seeing not, uh, <laughs> both motions would die for lack of a majority. So uh, either postpone to the next meeting or postpone indefinitely? What, what does the Why are we postponing? Do? No, we, we could physically, if you want to go through the motion of this motion gets uh, uh, voted 4-4, then we put the other motion on, gets voted 4-4. And so therefore, that it just is. Why wouldn't they just both die then? It's a more efficient way of getting both to die because the one would say, oh, okay. it's just a more efficient way of doing it. And I pres presume that if we postpone this one, Mr. Asa wouldn't be putting the other one forward, right? No, I'm just concerned. We're, so we're still going to vote on the original motion yes, of the graduation Yes, we take care of these amendments. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So let me say it this way. I, I move to postpone consideration of the amendment that's on the table till the next board meeting when we have nine people here. Is there a second for that? This is Max and Canelli. Comments on postponing to the next meeting? Mr. Peterson. I just want to say qu quickly that I, I hope it's clear to the public that we are all in favor of volunteerism. Yeah. We are all up here in, in halfway through what's going to be a six-hour meeting for us with no compensation you know, because we believe in what we're doing for the community. And I know from conversations with Dr. Jones that this is not a thing that is going to be excluded from the culture in the Fairfield schools. Um, so as long as, as long as that point is clear, we're, we're arguing about implementation. Correct. I think everyone up here would be happy to see something volunteer related as a policy, as a, as a as a preference of the Fairfield School System. Mrs. Maxson Canelli, you seconded it. Do you have a comment? I, I, I did just one brief comment and, and to, to phrase differently what Mr. Peterson just said, no one up here is arguing for none. So I, I think it's appropriate that one or the other moves forward because there hasn't been one voice against the idea of either mandating it or at the very least recognizing it. I do, however, it kills me to say this, did Mrs. Jacobson make that as a formal motion? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, are we required? I, I made I made the motion to postpone to the next meeting. You can and do you that even it. with an amendment on the table, um, a motion on the table? You can, you can amend an amendment once. Well, no, this is not an amendment to that amendment. This is postponing that amendment. But so the, I'm just asking a Robert's Rules qu and question. So you can, yes. you can postpone that yes, without taking that action amendment. on it? Yes. Gotcha. Correct. Mrs. Jacobson. No, I'm good. Mrs. Vitale. I just have one question about um, Ms. Jacobson's staff time to track still community service. Even if it's voluntary, you're still going to have to track it in order for students to be recognized that they're doing it, correct? So there's still going to be staff time and still be a tracking mechanism for that. So I'm j just to finish out the, dis <laughs> to no. finish out the discussion. Jake, can you wait one um, yeah, I'm waiting. Finish it up. Just to get an idea of the staff time that's involved in both options. So out of courtesy, I'll let you continue, but we are talking about a motion to postpone. We're not talking I, about the underlying amendment. Well, yeah, just kind of Robert. But isn't Ms. Jacobson's motion still on the table? 
uh, no, the motion that is now on the table that takes precedence is a motion to postpone her amendment. Um, okay. Yeah. So any more discussion on the idea of postponing uh, consideration of this amendment to the October 23rd meeting? Let me go out to the public because we go to the public on voting items. Uh, the motion that's in front is to postpone consideration of the amendment that Mrs. Jacobson made until the uh, next regular meeting. Any comment from the public on that motion? Having none, back to the board. Are you ready to vote? All in favor of postponing consideration to the next regular meeting, please raise your hand. Um, it, it's unanimous. Um, Am I correct that you will not be introducing your motion? No. Thank you. I'm not correct. You are incorrect. You still want to introduce your motion? Well, depending on how the conversation goes next, next week, maybe next, week. next meeting. Yeah, at the next meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant at the next meeting. No, I Today, mean, no. I, I yeah, don't want to right, talk about you. this anymore. Thank you. Can I, can I suggest that perhaps if Mr. Acer and Ms. Jacobson got together with Dr. Jones and between now and the next meeting, see if there isn't some meeting of the minds. There may not be, but I, I, it's not worth I, I mean, we could, but I, I still think we're still going to end up, so I think it's going to be a, a waste of time. So, and let's all agree that none of us are going to lobby the ninth member. I do think it's clear that this is going to potentially move forward in some way, so it might be a good idea to start brainstorming, Dr. Jones, on what would be involved for both scenarios most likely the volunteer so, scenario. So the motion to postpone was adopted. The amendment is off the table for further consideration. We're back to the main motion of adopting the policy as presented. Mrs. Maxon Canelli, do you have any further comments on that motion? Yes, so I would like to make a motion to postpone that vote because it's, I don't want to vote in a policy and promptly turn around and amend it. So I'd like to make a motion to postpone to October 23rd. I'll make the motion first. Uh, is there a second for that motion? Uh, Mr. Acer, any consideration of that motion? Discussion on that motion? O only a brief reference to that if this motion passes, I would um, definitely in policy committee create a clean, perfect draft and include that again in the next enclosure so that I would ask for one last set of eyes over it. Would those numbers change in the phrase? That's change? correct. Yes. Uh, uh, out to the public, any uh, comment on postponing consideration of the graduation policy till the next regular meeting? Seeing none, back to the board. Are you ready to act? Oh, Mr. Smaller, I'm sorry if I jumped the gun. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I have comments about if you do end up voting on the actual proposal. This is a come, motion to postpone. I yeah, I understand. So your comments should be on motions to postpone. I strongly would. Uh, support a motion to postpone um, mainly because uh, we had many thoughts the the FEA had many thoughts on the policy the graduation policy which we expressed prior to the summer break um, the policy was postponed and we would like an opportunity to be able to weigh in on that much more so we are very much in favor of uh, a po postponement of this vote uh, so we could have an opportunity to express our thoughts to the policy committee um, and furthermore I know we'd have a lot of teachers in the room right now if we knew a vote was being taken place we got very tied up with the start of the year and all the activities that take place with the start of the year it's a very important issue to all of the high school staff and so we would very much pr appreciate and uh, support a motion to postpone so we could at least weigh in at the policy committee level on our thoughts and then once we had a chance to weigh in fully whatever you decide to do that's your business thank you very much anybody else wish to come forward and discuss the motion to postpone seeing nobody stand up okay back to the board are you ready for action all in favor of the motion to postpone consideration of uh, policy 6146 to the next regular meeting please raise your hand it's and those opposed mr peterson the motion passes uh, seven to one thank you very much 
Uh, the next policy is adoption of policy 0200 educational goals. Hopefully this will go quickly. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education waive the first reading of policy 0200 educational goals and adopt policy 0200 as enclosed as new language was reviewed on June 12th, August 28th, and September 11th, 2018. And I'm referencing enclosure two. two. Yeah, here we go, enclosure two. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, is there a second? Mr. Peterson? Uh, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, you want to make comments? Uh, just very briefly, this is a reflection of um, for coming from central office, their uh, wish to uh, amend our educational goals, which had been worked on by in the community uh, from an ad hoc committee for several months. Um, and these seemed consistent with what we were looking to do as a district, consistent with the vision forward of the district improvement plan. And I thought it was appropriate that the policy committee take this policy up before we started looking at editing those, that language in the district improvement plan. And so uh, we did it at our last policy committee. Any other comments from policy committee meeting members on that? Any comments from the board? Seeing none out to the uh, public, uh, any comments on the adoption of policy 0200 to add the two goals reflected in enclosure number two? Seeing nobody come forward, if the board is ready to act, uh, all in favor of the motion that is in front of you to approve an, uh, the amendment to policy 0200 as stated on the agenda, please raise your hand. In favor, uh, Mrs. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is unanimous. Um, 8 0, thank you very much. Uh, we now have an item number four uh, the district improvement plan and the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the district improvement plan as updated September 25th, 2018. Do I have a motion? Mr. Peterson, seconded by Mr. Acer. Uh, Dr. Jones, do you have comments that you wish to make? Um, really, the only change from when the board saw this last time was the request to add columns that we could check off. So there's the complete in progress and if there's a new key implementation. Um, so you see that reflected in the green, blue, and yellow starting on page 25. Uh, questions from the board on the district improvement plan? Questions from the board on the district improvement plan? Ms. Jacobson? Um, we don't, we don't preclude uh, continued discussion even though we go to the public. So can I take that step, Mrs. Jacobson, and then come back to you? Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, district improvement plan for an amendment to the original district improvement plan that is, um, uh, has been considered for a number of months. Is there any member of the public that wishes to come forward and talk about the district improvement plan? Seeing none, back to the board. Anybody ready with a question or a comment? Um, I, I, shall we move forward to a vote if there are no questions from the board? Uh, Mrs. Jacobson? Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, a couple of things, um, and sorry, I'm trying. I was trying to make the edits to this at the same time as working. That wasn't going too well. Um, on page 13 of enclosure, I assume I want to make sure I'm working off the correct one. It's enclosure number two from September 25. Correct? Okay. Um, on page 13, I was just wondering if you could speak to two points on this page. The first one is the last um, bullet of the first point of implementing instructional rounds. I'm only wondering. If we're not doing that, why wasn't that something that we edited out? Well, there are still some schools that do instructional rounds. It's okay. not, we haven't completely taken it out, but um, we have, we have been doing the pre-K through 12 walkthroughs that we talked about last spring, but there are still schools that still do that. They, so, okay. Yes. So it, not necessarily at the district right. as the mandated level. Okay. Um, and then the bottom one under leadership capacity, demonstrate how educational mandates and reforms can be used to leverage school system improvement efforts. And I was wondering what that looked like. It's one thing when we approved the language to begin with, but how is it actually being done? You know, I think, um, and 
I would have to go back and even look. I don't know if on the cross-reference document this showed up or not, but if off the top of my head, if I'm thinking about educational mandates and reforms, probably one of the biggest, um, I think, places you would see that is a lot of what we're doing in social emotional health uh, and mental health, which we were talking about at the PTAC meeting last night. Um, there's a lot in that area. That's probably, our, I would say, our largest area. A dyslexia, for instance, which is a mandate. We've done so much training in that area. Um, I don't know if staff have anything off the top of your heads that you want to contribute past that, but especially in those areas. Yeah, I, I bring that up because obviously, invariably, when we're talking about mandates, a lot of time it's unfunded mandates, and so just to speak of them in a positive light, I wanted to know how this was, yeah. how this was being done in action. Um, also, district improvement plan section 1A, vision of the graduate. Obviously, this is all new so language. Page, on. Uh, the section 1A, uh, page 15. Yes. So this entire section is new. Yes. Um, and w one question I had for page 16. When we look at the all students will be um, and those, which I think, I mean, obviously we've had, that's now a mastery-based skills assured experience is focusing on some of these. Do any of these seem to, in, in your experience, call for us to revise other educational goals or do, the, do you believe these are consistent with those? Like, are any of these going even beyond what we've set for educational goals? No, I mean, I, th I think our educational goals are fine. And I, you know, when I look, I call these kind of tenets, and that's not necessarily what a lot of people would call them. But I think that we're doing exactly, if you look at the work plan, what we need to do to move all six of those forward. And I think the educational goals are written very, um, I think they're written systemic and they're very open-ended. And these are a little bit more specific, like innovation. Um, you know, to be able to have curriculum that supports innovation is unique. And so I, I think we're doing a good job with all six of those and meeting the goals. So there's nothing that else that you would have recommended as an edit? No, no. I, when this, this, you know, really represents a, all of last year, a team of people, community input, staff input. So we feel very good about this. And, you know, a lot of our um, administrators and teachers can tell you what those six words are now. And, you know, we've spent professional development talking about it. I think you even heard that from STEAM tonight. Mm -hmm. She was using some of the language that's from here. So, you know, we feel like it's, it's on the right track. And as a matter of fact, you know, you'll see there isn't a definition of what does it mean to be a communicator or innovator. And that was purposeful. And it goes back to, I think it was the question you asked about um, not defining for our teachers what everything has to look like and allowing them to be creative in their own teaching and not defining that this is what a critical thinker looks like. And this is, I assume, to your point then, this is also consistent with the idea that on that rating scale of one through four, this is being done across all departments. All departments can find ways to do these. And that's why they're, it's, they're being divvied up in different ways for who's responsible. I mean, we were seeing that on Infinite Campus when those scores were appearing. You're talking about like the academic expectations? Yes. Yes. It all fits, it all fit, it all fits together, and I think that's, that's kind of the beauty of it this year is we're getting to the point that all the different pieces are fitting together into the vision of the graduate. Okay. Um, I was wondering on page 17 with the, the school site specific focus on producing responsible citizens. Um, obviously, I saw a way of doing that is by doing community service. But are there, um, are, are schools producing rubrics? I mean, is that in any way being tied to a rubric measuring that or demonstrating that? It is in our work plan this year to be working on that. It's going to look a little bit different at every school. And okay. I, we don't see this as a, something we want to be measuring that has a rubric. We're very much focused on the academic expectations on the rubric side. This really is more about the culture and climate of a school and what are some of the programmatic you know, implement, implementations uh, from restorative classroom, responsive classroom, um, to the ward acronym, to the Falcons. It's really about those big cultural pieces. The Civics obviously comes through a lot of our curriculum, a lot. Okay. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain page 18. Yeah, page 18, this is actually the slide that was presented back in June when we presented Vision of the Graduate to you. And it talks about, you know, we have the district improvement plan. What is the mission statement? The mission statement has not changed from what, how it was devised in 2015. 
underneath that it's really connecting all three of those pieces so the how is that academic and root uh, academic expectations civic expectations that's how we're going to meet the vision of a graduate are those components that actually feed in together to create the vision of the graduate and the work are all what are the initiatives that make that happen so when you hear about steam where does that fit in or why is that even important well you heard him talk about collaboration critical thinking innovation all of those components are part of academic academic expectations so that's it all fits together so that it is one plan it's all about what is the vision we have for our children when they leave us after 12th grade okay um, and then just um, any of my other questions regarding indicators if I have any additional ones I'll send them to you I do want to thank you because uh, to the uh, board as I brought up at the some previous meeting I don't remember which one that I had noticed a discrepancy between what we're looking at indicators for now uh, versus before and so thank you for your very detailed response to my queries about uh, the list that appears on page 21 versus what had been the original approved plan so thank you for that uh, Ms. Jacobson do you have questions do. okay guys I'm starting on page 25 with the action steps just had some questions on some of these and um, how I came up with these questions was comparing it to the August version but that was our actual crosswalk document where everything was kind of outlined in the August um, so the first question I have was on 1 9 where it says are you with me you got it okay yes Yes. Good. Okay. Um, the develop a comprehensive transition program from grade five to grade six and from grade eight to grade nine to increase student success at grade six and nine. Um, I know it's marked as complete here, but actually a lot of these completes are ongoing, of course. They're not necessarily complete, right? So I was just wondering if you can give us a status update on what the latest and greatest with transitions is uh, right now, yeah, and I, or if I there's anything new or not. Yeah, I think it's a continuation of the work, and that was a, you know, those are difficult because in the last one, I presented this to you last time, I had ongoing, mm -hmm. but then there was, the feedback was we don't want to hear ongoing if it's been implemented, but once you implement something, it yes. should be always ongoing unless you're not going to do it anymore. So I've marked them complete. If we feel like mm -hmm. we've done a really good job on our fifth to sixth grade transition and our um, eight to nine transitions and doesn't mean we're not still working on it and every year whether that's math and getting closer and how we're transitioning students whether that's how we enroll them um, you know if that's well even this year you look at innovative learning and how the rollout for freshmen for instance looked at some buildings and compared how it looked last year that implements how do you approach you know digital literacy so both of those are going to be ongoing okay just wanted to check in on a status update on that one um, the next question I have was um, sorry 26 1 dash 24 and only because it's something that's come up in policy as well as review revise the district guidelines regarding homework to reflect the latest research it, right now it's in the plan for June 2020 I'm wondering if and I would propose suggest with that we move that to June 2019 it's been put on um, a future item on the policy committee and I know that we're interested in looking at that sooner than rather than later and I was wondering if you might and be open to the idea of changing that deadline to that timeline to 2019 um, to be honest I would prefer that we not because the work plan if you look at the volume of work that is in there and homework is kind of like graduation policy it's going to come with lots of different layers and we really need the time to work through it because I'm sure it will be not only controversial from the policy side but if the board actually does manage to tackle the policy first it will be much easier for us to work with it because we know the expectation of the board on the regulation side okay so if that happens you'd be okay um, number four eight I was wondering if it should be amended to instead of bringing sorry. sorry 28 Four dash eight. Should that be changing to a school issued device? No, because we still allow bring your own device. Slash. Um, okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So again, page on page twenty-eight. Four dash seventeen. Expand academic and non-academic enrichment opportunities to more K eight students. Right now, um, in the crosswalk plan, if you look, if you, um, you guys might not have it with you, but four dash seventeen is um, just and at this point anyway just has the grade three five steam program and I was just wondering when we were gonna be looking at more middle school changes well middle school is looking at um, their schedule they're looking at a lot of those starting this year that's in the work plan 
Okay, so that will be incorporated into that that's happening? Okay. Yeah, and there's other things like um, Stratfield's looking at what they're offering after school. We've got a new program at McKinley for mentoring this year. It's just, it's a little, you know, we're implementing things at different grade levels. Okay, I was just particularly interested in the middle school because it's just a lot of high school, a lot of elementary, but, yeah. you know. We're looking at their schedule, which also <coughs> will be things like, um, whether that gets into what clubs and things are offering after school, I, I think that's still to be determined. Lots of work to, to do with middle school. <laughs> We're just starting. All right, page 29. Um, six three at the bottom, it says complete all duct cleaning at Farfield Ludlow High School September 2019. But in our crosswalk, it was wherever it was it was done now yeah 2018 so was that was that just a type I wasn't sure if that was a typo or if it just wasn't complete no it was expected to all be done this fall and we still have a segment of it that we need to come back and do okay so I wanted to mark it authentically that it's still in progress okay it didn't quite get finished I thought maybe there's just like a yeah. typo or something but it no. is it's ongoing okay and then food for thought I know we haven't gotten there yet but under 5.0 under facilities um, I wish I'd kind of this had come after the board goal conversation because I wasn't sure if possibly as we're amending this document, updating this document, either after we adopt a goal later on or we don't or at some point, um, per, t per chance if the board would be interested or administration would be interested in per chance um, adding something under this facilities item to the district improvement plan that reflects something that pertains to the board goals that we're talking about later. So, in other words, pertain board goals, board goals that we're going to be talking about oh, later. So, um, since we have a very large board goal coming up later in this agenda, I was just wondering should that pass or some version of that pass if we might want to add that or a portion of it to the district improvement plan as it's something that we're working on. Just food for thought for the board on that and any open ending ideas on that, but um, as was possibly adding some items from the SPED audit that we're going to be discussing either, you know, this meeting and then the next meeting, possibly incorporating some ideas that the board might be open to that they find pretty pertinent to add to the district improvement plan from the special education audit. So those two things. I, I can say, I know we're just doing a... Um high level kind of overview of right. the special education audit. It, the things that are in the special education audit are already really reflected in the work plan simply because they were able to affirm a lot of the things that we were already doing like the dis and I'll give you an example from this year um, noting when they went through our IPs that we weren't consistent uh, across all 11 elementaries that's why we put the program facilitators in this year that was one piece was to help with that the other thing that we um, know is going to be going forward is looking at how we handle our uh, PPT processes in secondary um, we fully expect you'll see that during the budget this year and they were able to affirm that as well that was it I was just opening the conversation to the board if they wanted to add it to this plan uh, other comments or questions from board members on the district improvement plan Seeing none out to Wait, the one, one question. Please. Um, sorry, I, this one I did want to ask about. On page 26, 1 23, because in the crosswalk document it, where it says eliminated base requirement per state changes is, I mean, 123 complete. I don't even know what that is anymore because we've gotten rid of the computer proficiency. So I'm not sure what this mastery base requirement is well that that is what we talked about last year at least that was our perception of that um the is it called cis um the yes. course that we eliminated so that's why it's marked as complete but what was the i'm, I'm unclear on what the mastery based requirement is that we implemented we didn't well we didn't implement anything other than we got rid of the cis which is all good yeah <laughs> yeah Okay, so I just wasn't sure if this was, if this was re referencing something else that I could. Academic expertise yeah. type thing. I'm I don't know. I was just thinking, what was a mastery-based requirement regarding technology that we'd implemented, and I couldn't think of what it was that we completed. I, I don't know that we completed. I think we reviewed it, which is what it said. It, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. And I think we chose to like move away. Anything? Yep. Anything else from the board? I don't think I've. While we were waiting for. Mrs. Jacobson and Mrs. Maxon Canelli, we did go out to the public 
for public comment on this motion. So therefore, we've done that. Back to the board. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing no hands go up. Uh, the motion in front of us is that the Board of Education approve the district improvement plan as updated September 25th, 2018. All in favor, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Approval of Board of Education goal. Let me just make a comment before I put in the recommended motion. Um, we had 65 suggested goals, which with Mrs. Max and Finelli's recommendation in the resubmissions, we had hoped to get down to nine that could be rated, but we ended up with 21. Um, eight of the board members listed facilities as a top goal. Uh, the wording was different versions of it, but essentially eight board members all had facilities as important. Whereas the other goals that were ranked all had pockets of people, twos and threes and fours, but no clear majority. So I thought the board would need additional time to talk about those additional goals, but that because facilities was important, perhaps we could at least move that goal forward as an official goal while we then addressed the other suggestions at a subsequent meeting. And that's why this is on the agenda. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the September 11, 2018 Board of Education goal number one with the understanding that it will be based on receipt of the 2019-29 enrollment projections. Do I have a motion? Mr. Peterson, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, um, you received an enclosure number three, uh, but at your table there is a new enclosure number three that has not changed, only that the first one had goal number one in blue and then goal number one in black. Uh, we are adopting by this motion goal number one, which is in blue, and I didn't want the confusion to exist because there were two listed goal number ones. So the motion says that we're adopting goal number one as worded in the blue type um, in uh, both documents. And this was Dr. Jones's attempt to take the eight different suggestions and bring it into some generic facility goal that could be uh, reflective of the general tenor that the board wanted to head in. With that as a description, um, Dr. Jones, do you have any comments that you want to make? Uh, no, I mean, other than I just, I tried to consolidate, um, and you were very consistent on the four bullet points, but obviously there were some differences and nuances within each one of those, so, but there definitely was consistency among the board. This was the one goal that was very strong as far as these four things, these four items. Mr. Asa. Sorry, you, you may have just touched on this, Mr. Chairman, but what, what happened to the other goals? Um, because there were so um, a variety of uh, viewpoints as to whether any of the other four rose to the same level as facilities, it is my suggestion that we carve out a time at another meeting to talk about the remaining goals because so that okay, we can Okay, so get we're not clarity. just throwing them out. We're, not, ju we're okay. not just throwing them out. We're just postponing what could be a very lengthy conversation um, on those so that we can move forward on what is clearly something that the board okay. wants to Okay, thank on. you for clarifying. We, we will not, it'll be back on an agenda at a logical point. Um, other, uh, and I'm talking about the goals that were, um, if there are eight here, less than 21, that's quick math, 13. 13. So there are 13 remaining statements that would be part of that discussion. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, Ms. Pitko, Ms. Vitale. Uh, just very briefly, I appreciate the clarification to Mr. Asa, and I think this, I appreciate also that we're doing it this way, because I agree this is one thing that in some form or other was appearing everywhere. This is nice, concise, um, so I appreciate that, but I also do appreciate the future opportunity to, to talk over some of those other goals um, and to not dismiss them. Um, my only comment about the statement in blue is questioning the word vote and instead the word action or I use the word action because I think setting a direction could be deemed an action. We're not necessarily going to vote on these, so I wouldn't want to use the word vote. So I have just suggested that your June 30th, 2019, with crossing off A, Board of Ed, action on all four. And again, the action could be, that's a lot more vague. That would be my suggestion. I'll second that. Any discussion on replacing the uh, words A, B, O, E, vote? with the word action. Mrs. 
Jacobson followed by Mr. Acer on, yeah, the, no. on the amendment. It was something that I was going to raise as well, and I'm happy with that term. I was going to say aim to or strive to or some other provision, but that captures it just fine with me. Thank you. Mr. Acer. No. On the amendment. <laughs> Any other questions on the amendment? I wonder if I didn't go out to the public and asked if anybody had a comment on that. If anybody does have a comment on that amendment motion, please come forward. Seeing none, back to the board. Any other questions on the mo motion to amend goal number one to say take away the word A, BOE vote, and replace it with action? Seeing? You want to get rid of the word A. Get rid of it. Get rid of the A. Leave BOE and change the vote to Just action. Just to action. June 30, no, no. 2019, with Board of Ed action. Yes. Take away the word A and take away the word vote. Thank you for the clarification. And add action. <coughs> With that clarification, all in favor, please raise your hand. All in favor, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, do you have other comments on this? You had the floor, so that's why I'm going back to you. Me? No. No, okay. Uh, Ms. Bitko. Uh, before I vote on it, I. I need to understand something. In order for us to adopt this goal, um, and this is through the chair to Dr. Jones, are we going to be rehiring the consultant to look at tenure enrollment projections for, and you know capacity of our schools? I mean, how can we take action on any of these unless we have that information in front of us? Um, and I'll clarify that on the recommended motion, it includes a phrase and that it will be based on receipt of the 2019-2029 enrollment projections. So, the, uh, so within the agenda, that concept okay. of saying we will hire a consultant to give us updated projections, uh, the answer is yes. We, I'll, I'll, I'll state further that the consultant really has two jobs to do. One is enrollment projections, but when it comes to the concept of redistricting, the second scope of work will be suggesting redistricting options. So there are two different scopes of work, but same consultant. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Gerber. Yeah, this is just a piggyback on that. So I guess my question is, since we have this on or before June 30th, 2019, um, that means that we would be doing this work or that the consultants will be doing this work in the 1819 budget year. Do we have money in our budget to hire and retain the superintendent, uh, the uh, consultant to um, do all of this work? Because my understanding is that we didn't really have that much money in the budget to do this extensive, both a 10 year redistricting, I mean, 10 year enrollment projections and redistricting plans. I mean, that's pretty, that's a, a lot I think it depends on how much uh, in the redistricting that the board wants to get into it what we have in the racial imbalance plan is not drilling down to the street that work would come later after um, after June 30th so I do believe we would be able to fund what is in this goal uh, we've already contracted for the one-year projections we have to have that for the budget um, so we get that really quickly updating the other nine years is not uh, an, an enormous task because they look at your current enrollment look at the cohorts because um, the hardest thing is kindergarten that's the one-year projection that they do right now um, then looking at the redistricting we've done so much work um, that there's it's really going to be more of a board decision on what is the model for redistricting if the board is going to actually take that on uh, is it going to be when you think of the 2016 model is it going to be um, a different pocket type um, discussion because until you drill down to the street that's when you really are going to pay big money and we're not going to do that until you're really ready to move children because that changes every year you wouldn't want to go spend you know thirty five thousand dollars to do that right now Right, but I don't know how we would be able to do that because we are not experts in redistricting. I mean, that's why we're hiring consultants to be able to give us that information. I mean, I don't think the nine of us would be able to give that specific direction. I mean, I think that would, that's why we are 
we'd be hiring consultants like, who do this for a living to do that. I mean, it, it feels like we're kind of putting the car before the horse. No, the consultant will be able to tell you different ways that you could accomplish your goal. So what is the goal that the board wants to accomplish? Are you going to solve racial imbalance? Because th there are differences of opinion around this table about how we approach racial imbalance. Are you just going to solve um, the capacity issues that exist at certain schools where we are over capacity? Or are we really talking about whole scale and both of those come into play together. So I think there will be a series of questions and answers that will lead you to the solution. Ms. Gerber, do you have any follow-up? Not right now. Mrs. Vitali. Mrs. Vitali. Um, do we need to just get a little more specific with dates for some of these, or are we comfortable with June 30th, 2019? I'm just afraid that we're just going to keep on talking about the same thing over and over again and find ourselves um, in crunch time, you know, relocation of, or renovation of Walter Fitzgerald campus. Should we be, st well, that was pretty immediate, that we need to make a decision about that within the next couple of months or has that changed? We're going to move as quickly as we can on, on all four of these. Right now I would say we're all hands on deck, which you know, with ECC, having that discussion about how we're going to handle the overcrowding there. Um, the, the implementing an intra-district magnet or other program, we kind of put a big magnet to rest already. I mean, you did that, but the other program was the math concept. Staff are working on that right now to see, is it viable? Would, would we have space? Where would it go? Probably um, the uh, Walter Fitzgerald one will come next, and, that, and we want them to come as quickly as possible because they could have budget implications. But we did, as you remember, already build into the capital. Uh, that 200,000 so we have money to be able to make a move um, we also know we have a contract for next year um, where we believe that we'll be okay so I believe June 19th gives us time to work you know to get all the information that we need we're working on it right now uh, June 30 of 19 yeah June, yeah, yeah. Not June 19, 19. Oh. does that does that answer your comment yeah as long as we're just you know cognizant of it I don't want you know time to get away from us on addressing some of these issues and more for more for the board as opposed to staff that we're just keeping our agendas focused on these Ms. Pitko. Yeah, I have a follow-up to Mrs. Vitale's question in in accordance with time is Mr. Cullen looking at other locations outside of Fairfield Public Schools as possibly to move the Walter Fitzgerald campus or the ECC we are doing everything we can right now absolutely okay other questions for the goal Mrs. Jacobson Following up on two previous comments, um, you said that we signed, we have a contract for one more year for Walter Fitzgerald. I thought it was up this year, or did we sign a one year? Yeah, we'll have a one year that would get us through this, not this current year, but plus one. So you did sign an, a new well, one? Well, that's up to the town to do that, but that was the intent. Oh, it was, okay. Okay, I wasn't sure, I didn't know, that. I didn't, wasn't aware of that. Um, okay, and then the second thing is, just following up on Mrs. Gerber's comment about the comprehensive redistricting model. So just so I'm clear, you're going to be looking for the board to give direction for the consultants in terms of possible pathways. To be on, you know, or I mean, because usually they just they come up with salute. We give direction, like you give direction to the consultants about the issues, and they come back with the options rather than the board well, kind I of. And I, and I think we've talked about this a little bit. I mean, I think this board's going to have to make some very difficult decisions. And if you go back and look at all of the work that's been done through Malone McBroom, they have done so many different scenarios and different ways. And I think it's, I really do believe it's a series of questions about, you know, what are the priorities of the board and how we're going to approach it. And um, I think they have actually, you know, consulted on this issue a couple of times and, and given us some pretty challenging scenarios um, on how to, you know, solve things. Last year they showed us where we had overcrowding at Sherman how you could actually you know move some students but it didn't move everybody in the district and it didn't necessarily solve racial imbalance so I think once the board is able to answer those questions they'll be able to say if this is the scenario that looks like we're going you know forward with okay here might be another way to tweak it so so in the so in the um, motion here or in the goal actually the way that it stated the de desired comprehensive redistricting model are, are, we, are you going to be providing with several options of those models that you have in mind in, in drafting this goal? Or are we coming to that ourselves? No, I think you could go look at all of the work that's been done, and I think that's one reason it's been so confusing. So do you yes. mean like pocket redistricting, closing yeah. a school? 
well, you know, I don't think you. I don't think the sports comprehend want to rehash okay. all those things that you just really in the last twelve months we rehashed. But I, I think this board's going to end up going back to what you were talked about at twenty sixteen. Um, and looking at because that's where we keep going back to is equality for all and that you know if you're looking at really solving racial imbalance or not so up to a comprehensive yeah redistricting okay Mr. Right, Jacobson you. are you done no, no, no. yep sorry okay yep. Mr. Mm -hmm. wait a second <laughs> where was I did I miss no uh, Mr. Peterson had his hand up and then Mr. Asa all right I'll, I'll, I'll be fairly quick um, uh, through the chair to Dr. Jones, the, the, uh, talking about Walter Fitzgerald, we, we toured the facility just last month. Uh, my understanding was the decision about whether to pursue a new facility or extend the lease was still open. Well, when we talk about one year, we've given ourselves another year because we could not commit to getting the kids, which is what we said when we actually toured. What we, what we haven't done is said we can leave our kids there five more years. They wanted a, initially a five-year lease, um, and that's kind of where the discussion has been with the town. There was, there was also discussion at the time about whether a new lease would be accompanied by uh, a commitment from the property owner to do repairs at that facility. We are actually, we have a meeting um, next week or the week after actually with the owners of the property and we are working, we're working on that with the town. It just feels like that was a significant thread of our discussion and the board's concern that I would not like to be Absolutely. Kind of scooted over. Yeah. We it, saw the facility and we, I, I, I can't speak for everybody, my sense is that we all saw many things that we felt needed absolutely. to be, needed to be fixed for the good of the students who were there. Absolutely. And the staff for that matter. Um, all right. Well, just having, having made that that argument. I just want to make a broad point about about redistricting because this is a useful time to do that. Um, I, I, there's a lot of work to do and a lot of specific questions that we need to answer. But I think, in some ways, the interesting part for me about this goal process that we've gone through is the degree of I don't, I don't want to say uniformity, but like the broad sense of the board that a large large task remains before us relative to redistricting. I think it's kind of important for the town to hear that, is that this is something that we are considering at a, at a very important level and at a very high priority level. Um, so I was kind of, I, I was, it was difficult. We put this off in the, in the September meeting um, because I thought that that was, you may have been useful for, for the public and other boards to hear prior to mm -hmm. where the Mill Hill discussion went. Just, just for me to put that out there as my, as my personal view. Yeah, I just want to echo what Dr. Jones said and, and just stress the point that with regards to the fourth bullet point here, um, I support this, this goal, um, but a couple things have been said and, and I agree. I, I think before we start spending money on a consultant and projections and whatnot, this board really needs to decide which direction we're going in. And it's going to be a very tough decision. And, and the decision in my mind that I'm thinking this board is going to have to make, um, and this is just my opinion, um, is that are we going to solve racial imbalance with redistricting, which would also solve the overcrowding, space efficiency, utilization maximization, everything else that goes along with it. And if that's the case, then I think we're going about um, it's been clear it was you know, voted on in 2016 that a top to bottom comprehensive redistricting would, would be the answer. However, if this board goes in the direction of um, not wanting to use redistricting as the end all be all, that we still need to look at it, but maybe our approach is slightly different and that whereas with the racial imbalance and, and, and efficiency, we're looking at a top to bottom, maybe with the other, we're looking at that as well as some other options. So just to, to concur and agree with what you've said, but I do think it's very important that when we do go about getting this consultant, that we give them um, a, a charge that makes sense. So we're not getting scenarios that don't align with what we're thinking. So I think we're going to come to a point in the very near future when this racial imbalance and whatnot comes up um, is 
not whether necessarily we're just going to say we're not dealing with it or whatever, but if we're going to continue on the path that we are and hope for a slow, slow down, you know, change in trends and whatnot, or are we going to listen to the state and take on this undertaking because of racial imbalance? So I just want to be clear that from, uh, from me as a board member, I want to see this board be clear on why we would be looking at redistricting, and from that point, forming a committee and getting you know, the next steps of the plan. Other comments from Ms. Pitko? I agree with Nick. I just want to add one more thing. I don't remember exactly when the date is when our next town hall meeting is, but if we all agree to adopt this goal tonight, this is definitely something we should be openly discussing with the public. They should be well aware of the issues facing many of our schools. Yeah, I think it's December is what our schedule is. I don't know the exact date, but I think it's in December. Um, two, three, four, five. Uh, do we have any other comments from people who have not yet made comments about this goal? Uh, Ms. Pitko, you wanted to address the question of whether the full board is going to address this or a subcommittee is going to address this. And um, uh, I thought the last meeting that we had, the full board expressed a view that they wanted to do that as a full board but you wanted to bring that question back up again. Do you still wish I've to? changed my mind. We need to discuss this as a full board. Okay. Uh, just I'm just happy that we're moving in this direction. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to do that if you did want to, uh, Mrs. Gerber. Um, yeah, well, I, just one thing I did want to bring up just in terms of the 2016 Malone and McBroom um, information that was uh, put together, um, you know, with the redistricting plan, including that, you know, they had a lot of different options, including that one that was, or a couple that were like top to bottom, at least on the elementary level. Um, you know, yeah, those plans were out there, but those were also two years ago based on numbers of the students there. And, and it was a top to bottom, but I'm not sure if everyone is, recalls that, some of those plans were talking about taking maybe 11 children from Dwight and putting them in Burr. They were talking about taking 15 kids from North Stratfield and putting them in Jennings. And those were kids who were in the school at the time two years ago. So yes, Malone and Brune have those plans, but I'm not sure how viable those still are now. And I'm not sure how comfortable this board is at the prospect of moving you know, 10 children from one elementary school to another. So that's, that's why I was asking about Malone and Brune coming up with another plan, because yes, we have that. And, Assuming that we adopt this goal, I strongly suggest that everyone revisits that 2016 document, which I believe is still posted online. Um, but just to really see what does a, a district-wide elementary redistricting look like, at least the ones that we have. I mean, those plans were, they moved everyone, but we're talking very, very small groups of students who were in elementary school two years ago. So some of those neighborhoods may have completely changed and may change again. I mean, if we're talking about looking at redistricting in the next one or two years, it's going to be even more so. So I, I just think that while that might be a good template to look at, there's still going to be a lot of work that's going to be need to do be done on those plans, which was why I was asking about how much we are planning on using Malone and McBroom and how much money we have in our budget this year, because we can't just rely on two-year-old redistricting plans. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Vitale, followed by Ms. Jacobson. Well, I think it comes back to also finding out, as you said in previous meetings, the size of Mill Hill. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we can only go so far with this, I think. Well, I think wha probably what we will have to do is also come up with a few different permutations to be able to say, and again, this would be different w with what, you know, perhaps Malone McBroom was looking at, because don't forget, all of those plans that they put forward were predicated on Mill Hill being a 504. So if Mill Hill is going to be a 378, which I don't think anyone here wants to have happen, but let's just say for the sake of argument, or a 441, that will completely change, especially if we are talking about moving 10 to 15 students from one school to another. I mean, so that's just something else that we need to keep in mind. Um, Mrs. Jacobson. Um, Dr. Jones, I was just curious as to, um, in order to meet this goal of June 2019, when would you foresee actually needing to contract with Malone and McBroom, which may guide the timeline as to when we need to sit down and make those, have those conversations, ask those questions, have town hall meetings, provide for community input, all of that, and time for you to 
be able to contract with them and meet this goal. So I'm just looking for a rough, doesn't have to be exact, but a rough your idea of timeline on this in terms for the board, community, and Malone and McBroom. Yeah, I, w I would have to bring that back to the board. The okay. Actual, I, I can tell you, I think that's one reason why the goal, I'm really glad it's on here because we've already started this goal. You know, so we've already done the one year projection. So the next level is really, does the board want us to go ahead and we're going to look at redistricting? So that's very helpful because the other three the board's been very clear on. So we've, we're really moving on that work right now. I'm just looking yeah. for an idea of when we're going to need to bunker down. That's. I think we're going to be hunkering down like, you know, starting every month. I mean, these are, th this is an enormous amount of, you, you could do nothing but just that last bullet and that's enough. So trying to talk about relocating two facilities, a special program, and also comprehensive redistricting is, I mean, those are full meetings, like more than one. So, you know, we need to map it all out very carefully. And just a quick follow up, because we have these new facilities issues that were not present in 2016, um, as Mrs. I'm oh, sorry, 2000, what? What did I say? Are you talking to me? No. Oh, okay, shush. Um, 2016. Um, and things may look very differently based on whatever options come forth from staff or both Walter Fitzgerald and ECC or whatever directions that we want to go in with those programs as well that were not a part of that 2016 endeavor. So right. we're in a little bit more unique circumstances than that. So just food for thought. Thank, Thank you. you. Mrs. Maxson Canelli and Mr. Acer, did you have your hand up and I forgot to call on you? No. Okay. <laughs> he just Maxson does it reflexively. Canelli. Just I, flaps. I my watch actually. So yeah, that's what I objected happened. to. Oh, I didn't want to okay. see him look at his watch. Um, I, I just want to follow up on Mrs. Jacobson's point is that I think it would be very helpful if we had a non-binding but comprehensive calendar of the year I mean and that could include anything from are we looking at the principles again the the principles that governed the actions of Malone and McBroom when they started putting those together I mean it's worth looking at them they were produced by another board it's worth talking about if it's still what we believe in and if it is then it's a quick discussion but if it's not it allows p potential latitude to any type of redistricting discussion but all of the parts of this I think it would help if we saw it as a big picture so we see that if we and because we also could give feedback on it then if we say oh you think we want to, that we're going to make a decision on this but I can't make the decision on the ECC until I know this part and if the calendar was looking at we're not going to talk about that till March that would give the board a chance to say we really need to refigure this so I'm not sure if that's to the board officers um, to the board officers to, to Dr. Jones but I, this, I completely agree with Dr. Jones that this is a very, very meaty goal that we're taking on here, and I think we need to have a, a sense of the story of it, of, of how is this going to unfold, and because what we can't do is, while they need to be very rigorous and, and thoughtful discussions, we also can't dither on certain things. I mean, we, progress needs to be made, so I would just ask to the officers, to so, uh, Dr. Jones, I, I with some type of calendar. What you're asking for is essentially is a decision-making tree. If yes, we go this direction. If no, and then does that lead us to the next subject and the next subject? You know, what decisions have to be made before the next decision and what time frame that they're on? However that time frame is laid out, I... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ms. That Pitko. to the front table. Ms. Pitko. I wanted to follow up on Mrs. Gerber was talking about back in 2016 when McLonig McBroom presented their possible scenarios. I asked a series of questions, one of which was affordable housing developments in the 830G, and they had not configured that into their enrollment projections. Now, two years have passed, and we have many more of these in town, and I know Dr. Jones um, gets some information from the town engineering. I would like to see more of that in our 10-year projections because this town is reshaping where people are moving to and we need to be very careful. I don't want to have to do this again in five years. Thank you. Mrs. Vitale, can, can, can I ask you just one question? Does, does Ms. Vitale have the last word? <laughs> Ms. Vitale. I think that we need to think about how we're going to approach these, whether or not it's going to be the full board table, all of us talking about these, or if we're going to send some to committee. We have the Finance Committee, and not to sound like a broken record, but I really think that we should revisit the Long-Term Planning and Facilities Committee. I think there's a lot of work to be done. 
Um, just the last year, we've been saying we want to talk about it as a full board, and we're still talking about it, and I really don't feel like we've gone all that far. So over the next month, before November comes and bylaws change, I would just ask people to think a little bit more about the ways that we can be most effective. Um, both for ourselves and for our staff and moving these things forward. Yeah. Right now, we're voting this goal as a committee of the whole to work on it. But in November, if the board, when it looks at its bylaws, decides to create a third committee that would take on some of these actions, that the board can do that. This doesn't preclude that. No. Yeah. Can I go out to the public? Any member of the public wish to comment on the uh, motion that's in front of us, which is adoption of goal number one, as stated on enclosure number three? <coughs> Please state your name and address. Yep. Bob Smoller. I'm president of the Fairfield Education Association. Um, the t couple comments I'd like to make, um, I do think deadlines matter. And I don't think that the decision on ECC and the World of Fitzgerald campus is something that you can say you're going to decide on by June 30th, 2019. That needs to be in this year's budget. If we don't make a decision for this year's budget on ECC, you're essentially looking at a de facto decision to decentralize it for another year. Um, clearly, I think, well, the staff's feeling anyway, and I've written to all of you on this, is that a centralized model for ECC is absolutely the best practice in the state and optimal for these students. And it has been a, a detraction from their educational experience to have this small group over in Stratfield right now. And uh, we would very much like to see, I mean, if your decision is you're going to decentralize it, make that decision. But uh, we feel very strongly the other way, and we feel it needs to be done in this year's budget. Because if it's not done in this year's budget, you're just kicking the can down the road, and the only way to solve the solution at that point in time will be a de facto decentralization, because you just don't have the room and ward to put these extra kids that are showing up. They just, they, they just don't exist. So I would r highly recommend that you do change the deadlines on the ECC and Walter Fitzgerald for the same reasons. Um, and the other comment I would make is um, I think it's more than redistricting that you're talking about. I think it's redistricting. I think it's feeder patterns. And I do think, to Ms. Vitale's point, I think you need a long-term facilities plan. I mean, we're the ones teaching in these buildings all day long. You've got some very old buildings in this, in this town, and we're patching them up as best as we can. But, you know, some, some of the instances, there's some health issues that I think staff would argue are in existence. And I think, you know, you need to take a look at, you know, what's going to happen long term with how we're going to configure the school district as far as the facilities are concerned. So I, I would encourage you to look at not just redistricting, but I would encourage you to look at the long-term facilities plans. Are these buildings sufficient for the needs going out to the next 50 years or so? And also what the feeder patterns are going to look like, because once you redistrict the elementary schools, you're going to now look at the changing the feeder patterns to the middle schools and the high schools as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to come forward and speak? Please come forward, state your name and address. Hi, my name is Matthew Halleck. I live at 6 Somerville Street in Fairfield. And um, first, I just want to thank everybody here. To me, you all are rock stars, really. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you do for our children and for the school. Um, I'm really, I know I'm talking about ECC and the redistricting and, and the decentralization. And I'm just wondering why you don't talk about old field school at all. Um, you know, it's currently leased out to a private daycare company, a fantastic company, a preschool company, um, who does a great job. But they, um, they have a fantastic lease with the town for 10,000 square feet um, for only $7 a square foot, very cheap. Um, they've expanded to occupy almost 50,000 square feet now. So they have about five times more than they're contracting and paying for. In addition, they've erected a lot of fencing around Old Field, so they basically closed it off to the whole public. And that was a beautiful park overlooking the open space. I grew up playing catch and basketball with my children there. And it breaks my heart to see it closed off and fenced off like that. And um, I went down to the town hall and I got the lease. And I looked at the lease and there's no mention of any of the grounds or the park being part of 
the arrangement so it bothers me and it seems to me i know the town owns the school not you but you are the board of ed and you are the schools you should have first dibs and should have a major say in the utilization of that space so i ask you to look at oldfield school um, in the next couple of years i know there's you know all sorts of uh, zoning and, and fema and requirements but it is being used as a preschool right now and especially for ecc you know um, which is a preschool it's just a different constituency it's special ed's kids is still preschool um, to look at that option as you move forward thank you thank you anybody else from the public wish to come forward seeing nobody come forward back to the board is there any more discussion on the motion in front of us which is adoption of goal number one as shown on enclosure number three as amended no hands up. Uh, the motion in front of us is that the Board of Education approve the September 11th, 2018 Board of Ed goal number one with the understanding that it will be based on receipt of the 2019-2029 enrollment projections and I'm adding the phrase as amended. That's the motion in front of us. We all understand it. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, oh, you, you did. Okay. Uh, uh, 8-0, thank you very much. Uh, item number six is a, a traditional item on our October agenda, which is an opportunity for board members to make any uh, suggestions uh, about uh, what they would like Dr. Jones to consider as she and her staff are uh, uh, developing next year's budget. Uh, generally in November, we ask Dr. Jones to come forward and say, here is what I'm budgeting for from major initiatives, not the traditional just increases on different line items, but uh, items of significance that will add or subtract from our budget. And then, of course, in December, we talk about the uh, uh, pension and health, although that issue has become less now that we're in partnership 2.0. And then, of course, in January, we go through the line item review. So uh, with that as an explanation, uh, any comments from board members on uh, budget ideas that they would like to have considered uh, as the, the staff develop the budget? Mrs. Gerber. Well, not so much a request, but just, I guess, more of a question just in terms of, um, I'm just curious of how the uh, Innovative Learning Initiative may possibly affect um, the upcoming budget are there plans to expand one-on-one uh, -on -one to other grades um, in middle school at least or elementary school um, and if so just how is that gonna uh, impact the budget and then I guess the other question too is I know that we have um, in the uh, long-term facilities plan there is that money set aside for um, Walter Fitzgerald but uh, I'm just kind of curious so is that then based on the fact that you've signed a lease or the town has signed a lease for the coming year that means that that will be that that's the lease money or no that has, that doesn't that's actually in the facilities the right water okay the, the lease money is a, a line item in the correct budget. that's that that's not gone away. okay so then the i guess my question is and i know that that right now we're talking about operating budget but i guess i'm just curious as to what impact or if any that may that may have if i recall mr cullen's answer at the time uh, last September when he added that line item it was that we wanted the Board of Finance to know that there is an issue at Walter Fitzgerald so we put in quote a placeholder with a certain amount of money in there so that it would alert the Board of Finance that uh, fairly shortly um, um, we may be coming to them with that as a project is that a fair statement mr. Cullen let the record show that he shook yeah. his head yes so but through the chair to dr. Jones that is your because I was actually the question was directed to dr. Jones not to the chair so yes that's many that we together plan to put in uh, the waterfall so that if we needed to move it we had money to be able to paint or do whatever we needed to do in another okay. facility or just the, even the movers okay and then also I guess the technology question which was yes. my first um, I don't I don't see the technology yes we, we plan to expand it from middle school to finish it would the seventh graders the devices will move up to eighth so we would be adding sixth and seventh I don't see that as huge impacts to the budget um, it, it, it'll be uh, the, pretty much the normal tech budget is the way that we've seen it 
Other questions or comments from the board on <coughs> next year's budget, Mrs. Jacobson, and followed by Mrs. Vitale. Um, I was just curious if I know we're talking about the audit again after this item, but if there would be things from the special education audit that may come up within the budget, and it's not something I want to know right now, it's just there were things in the audit that I think, you know, point to some needs in terms of that area, so is that something that obviously I assume you're building that in, but it was just thought I would mention yes. that? Yes. Okay. Um, also, just following up on the innovative learning as well, but not really the innovative learning, more on the budget line item. I was wondering if I, um, one of my requests for next budget will be that the section 503 of the budget, which is the technology line item, if it could possibly be broken down further. Most of our areas go by item. Um, it's a large line item that doesn't really have any detail to it, so I think that you know, Board of Finance had always had asked for some detail too, so I know that Nancy's working on some of that information and I assume that that would be forthcoming at some point as well. Yep. Can I ask for clarification that there is a list in the book of individual projects that will be done. Are you meaning broken down more than that traditional list? No, but in the, in the line by line part of the budget. I don't mean in the summary page where there's little details of things, but Sorry, it's Jen. It's no, back. it's it's a different part. It's in the back. It's yeah. a much longer verbiage in the in the back. No, I meant actually putting it in the budget book, like in no. the it line. It is in line. the budget in book. The line There's line a narrative. In the budget book. I, I don't know how to explain yeah, it. Okay. So you wouldn't be on the mute. You wouldn't break the 503 line out like that. In, I think that's what she's asking. That, that right. Category. Break it. Break it out. You, right. Yeah. I mean, we don't. That's not the way that Munis even pulls it out. But it is in the very back of the budget book where it has the list specifically what we're what we're purchasing. Yeah. Okay, I was just looking for it inside of the pay 503, but that's not something that can be done based on the way that things are purchased? Not really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yep. Is that anything further, Mrs. Jacobson? Mm, not right now. Okay, uh, Mrs. Vitale. Um, mine is m more towards maintenance. I mean, just oh, the last few weeks with the heat and the humidity. Um, really just kind of looking at that line item and you know putting money there for for you know to do something um about the heat about the humidity kind of just or not even doing something about it to research more for a solution because i think we can't go on like this um for the health and safety and just for the f the well-being of the physical space um, a lot of issues have come up. I'm hoping to get more information about where we are on some of those issues with our buildings. Um, but I th think that we need to start spending some more money on that line item. If, if I could comment just quickly, this, this topic came up at the uh, BOF's capital planning workshop in the end of September where Dr. Jones did, uh, they asked, they said what, what big projects may be coming down the pike. And this was right after uh, several hot uh, high school open houses um, and there was uh, Dr. Jones did mention it uh, to the Board of Finance as something that we probably need to look at and there were voices on the Board of Finance that seemed to be very receptive to that idea. Well, and I know that we've talked about air conditioning, we talked about a finance committee, but I'm even wondering if there's, you know, that's still long term. It could take a while to get some of the changes that we want to see um, implemented. And if there's just anything else that we could do in the short term to kind of alleviate some of the, um, mm -hmm. the problems that we had this year, I think we should look at that and be willing to invest in it. Other comments from board members on uh, things to consider while constructing the budget? And remember, these are suggestions. The superintendent takes all suggestions from staff as well as board members and uh, does the best she can with, uh, with creating a budget. And then, of course, it's up to us to review that budget. Anything further from the board? Uh, Ms. Jacobs. I have a couple things. Just given some of the transportation challenges that we had this year, I was just wondering if you were looking at when that contract is up or when that's due or if things are really working as efficiently as they should be for our families and students or if maybe that's an area that we might need to look at a little bit in the next budget I'm just that seemed to be a pretty challenging situation the beginning of the year um, 
and knowing that some of the routes are proving to be a little bit difficult. So just touching base on transportation. Yeah, I might just say it's not a budget issue at all. That's software driven, uh, implementing new software. And honestly, I think we both think if we had a brand new company, it would probably really have been, oh, I, we can't even imagine. Because um, this company at least has worked with us and we know them and it's been, a, it's been the software. And some of it is um, when, Men, when Ms. Munsell really looked at our old software and, you know, when you're talking about software that's 30 years old that we've been using literally for, you know, three decades, um, the GPS that is attached to that software does not match the GPS we have today. So part of the route issues have been, you know, implementing board policy and who gets to ride and who doesn't. You put that in and the mileage into the computer. So people that have been riding the bus for two decades are all, were all of a sudden showing up that they really weren't supposed to, for instance, be riders because they were two blocks farther than you know, we're allowed or so there are, there are lots of issues like that in implementing new software, but it's, I think it's quietened down now. It was definitely a, a rough start and thanks to Ms. Munsell and Mr. Ficke, but um, for, for being on that, but it's, it's definitely a route issue, not a money issue. And uh, the contract is up when? So yeah, this year and next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two more next years. year. Okay. Okay. Just thanks. to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, anything else? Anything else from the board? Seeing no hands on uh, deck. Uh, we're on to the special education audit highlights. While we're bringing Mr. Uh, 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 Bob up, um, how much time will it take for you to kind of go through the highlights? No, just so I can plan um, time. Probably 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Let's assume 15 minutes for the financial review. Uh, uh, how many members of the public are waiting desperately to talk at the end of the meeting? Uh, seeing none, so that's a half an hour. So a motion to amend, uh, pick a time, and we'll do it. Um, I'll just make a motion to extend to 1130, just to play it safe. motion is to extend to 1130. Mrs. Vitale, any questions on that? Any discussion on that? Hearing none, all in favor of extending the motion, the meeting to 1130, please. Raise your hand. Uh, Ms. Vitale, Mrs. Gerber, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Jacobson. Uh, the, motion, <laughs> the motion fails. And at 11, I don't know. I mean, you don't want to stop in the middle of so the presentation. So we will end at 11 o'clock wherever we happen to be. Special Speak Education Audit well. Highlights. Um, is there anything different in your presentation that we have printed out that we don't need it on the screen? No, I, I could go through the PowerPoint. So can I uh, ask you, perhaps, while we're searching for the power cord, Mrs. Munsell, do you want to just quickly highlight some of the financial and we'll move things along? So feel free to stay there. Just. <coughs> I can take you from June on, or do you want me to do a recap of the year? Depends on how long it takes to get the court. <laughs> I, think, I think you've answered your own question. Okay. Um, well, last year was um, one certainly for the, um, uh, for the history books. Um, we started with no budget. We, even at this point in time last year, we had no budget. It wasn't until October 31st. Um, we had the reserve, which we uh, restored back to maintenance, uh, technology, and for the pension. Uh, we knew about the CBAC uh, savings. Uh, we did, in the end, spend the 400 on technology, pre-purchasing the technology for this year, and returning 600,000 to the town. Um, at the end of the year, after the school year was um, ended, and we, you know, all our, all our expenses were validated. Any av available balance was used to purchase uh, instructional materials, um, steam resources, and collaborative space furniture, um, which essentially restored the um, school site allocations. Um, so that's a recap. Questions on the highlights for the prior year's budget? Just one. If there are any other questions, feel free to talk to Dr. Jones afterwards. I only, I just, I'm fuzzy on this. I can't remember. The pre-purchase technology equipment, once again, what was that equipment, that 403? 
thousand. It was Chrome for the Chromebooks. At the time that we approved it, what were we thinking it was for? Chromebooks. Okay. Uh, no, at the time we approved the 403, we said the best use of it will be technology, period. Uh, at that, the time, I, I believe that uh, when we voted that uh, or recommended it, I don't know that we actually cast a vote, um, I think the carts were still an option. Yeah, because yeah, that was back but in it was, January. It was voted to use that money for technology. Okay, that's, that's what I couldn't remember. That So we did not designate it. I, I don't recall, but... I'd have to, we'd have to look at the record. Okay. I, I mean, I think that we said Chromebooks, but at that point we just thought the Chromebooks were going to be on the car. Yeah, that might be the difference. Uh, my recollection is that there was around $400,000 identified for the Chromebook initiative as it had been originally planned yeah. that was part of the budget submission. And because it was close to the supply order, that's why the concept of prepay came out. Um, that's my recall. Anything else further? If not, while they're loading the PowerPoint, let me just take a note of personal privilege. Uh, I have very much enjoyed my service on the board, and I can look forward to continuing to serve on the board. And I've actually enjoyed the last six years as chair. But I am a firm believer that uh, no volunteer board should be led by the same person forever. And in the past, perhaps we did not have as many alternatives. Uh, but I think we have eight board members who are able especially if we work in a collegial and trusting fashion. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, it's a question, I think, of who is ready and willing based on their personal and you know, professional schedules. Uh, so I w am not seeking renomination in November, and I only say that so that we don't have racing around in the last week or so before the election and say, well, who can get five votes? I wanted to give the board enough time to as uh, Joan Rivers would say, talk among yourselves and figure it out. Um, I am looking forward to being a member. Having that said that, are you ready? Thank you. Almost, as soon as it turns on. <laughs> we got it plugged in. What's that? You, the board had just asked for those. And I remind the board that by our bylaws at 11 o'clock, the meeting is over. Okay. Uh, no adjournment is needed. So as, so as quickly as you can go through, and uh, Okay, good evening everybody. Well, well um, it pulls up, there it is. Um, my name is Rob Mancusi. I am the director, the executive director of special education and special programs. I, I welcome you from our, um, our consultants, I'm sorry they can't be here tonight. They're working on another project. That's why they're coming in November to answer more in-depth questions and to discuss, um, discuss the process that they've gone through. It's been an interesting process because we've had four snow days, which canceled four visits to district, and we had a rain out last week when they were supposed to be um, presented to you, and we all had a challenging ride home that night. So. Just to remind the board, the purpose of this audit was to review special education program and services in the Fairfield Public Schools. Dr. Um, Jones mentioned also um, we have some inconsistency in terms of the IEP development process. Um, so we wanted to, them to analyze that. We wanted them to analyze service delivery um, within the district with respect to least restrictive environment. Um, we wanted them to review comparative data with Derg A districts who are our neighbors around us and our Derg B um, colleagues. And we wanted them to help identify possibilities to increase efficiencies within the department. Okay, this is just a quick slide. Those are your Derg A districts. It's all in your PowerPoint. So those are our neighbors all around us. And then. Um, Fairfield, Greenwich, and Trumbull are in Dergby, along with um, our other colleagues from those other towns. All right. Some of the highlights uh, of the audit is in terms of the time that students with disabilities spend in general education classrooms, um, it's a celebration for us. We do better than our Derg A counterparts and our Derg B counterparts with 78% of all students with disabilities in the Fairfield Public Schools um, spending 
at least 80% of their day with, with in the general education setting. Um, another important data point, I'm going to have to say my PowerPoint just cleared. Um, this, if somebody could please come up here and um, assist me. I could just go through the slides while we correct this um, technical error. I'm on slide one, two, five. It's cleared. Okay, I, just going on, on the next slide, some just information that I think is important for us to know. In terms of special education teacher to student ratios, DERG A has for every 9.71 students with disabilities, they have one teacher. DERG B has 10.89. We um, in 1617, which this is comparative data, so DERG A and DERG B, it's 1617. So our 1617 data was for every 10.92 or almost 11 students with disabilities, there was a special education teacher. Over the last two um, school years, um, we've been able to add additional special education teachers to bring our ratio um, down to 10.14 to 1. So that's, um, that's a positive celebration. The next slide talks about special education paras to student ratio. Um, our DERG B counterparts ha um, have more paras per special education students at 5.5 students to one para, where our DERG B, DERG A is six to one, and we are 6.32 to one in terms of how many paras we have to support our students with disabilities. Um, the following slide, and if there's any questions, I know we're, we're tight for time, just interrupt. The following slide discusses our behavioral support staff to student ratio. Um, the lower the number here, the better off we are. So this includes school psychologists, school social workers, and um, school counselors. We're, we're in line with our DERG A colleagues. For every 16.5 students, we have one behavioral support staff. Where our DERG B colleagues, for every 18 students, they have one um, behavioral support staff. Some of the highlights um, in this. You'll see um, our four-year cohort graduation ratio for students with disabilities. Our 16, 17 most recent data, 80.4% of Fairfield Public School students with disabilities graduated in four years um, compared to the DERG B average of 77%. Not all districts have reported this information to the state yet, so that's based on the districts that have reported. Um, currently, the special education department is re reviewing processes and procedures. Um, relative to graduation rates for students with disabilities, I will say, looking at the fi five-year trend data, our, our graduation rate for students with disabilities as four-year cohorts has continually increased from 69.1% five years ago to 80.4% 80 80 to our most recent data, which is another celebration. Um, the Fairfield Public Schools, um, we were commended for providing professional development opportunities, appropriate professional development opportunities for our staff. Fairfield Public Schools provides sufficient instructional material to support teaching and learning, um, particularly in the area of instruction, instructional technology. And I just want to sh give a shout out to Katie Cronin, who is our AT um, you know, specialist in the district, and she does a tremendous amount of work in terms of providing and train the training um, for staff in the use of instructional technologies to support programming for students with disabilities. Um, Fairfield Public Schools is committed to support instructional improvement efforts, which has been traditionally 
a significant strength of ours and higher than the state average. Um, one of the, the things that was mentioned that is an area of growth for us is consistent implementation of student programming at the secondary level. It's impacted by the number of staff involved in the coordination and facilitation of PPTs. So um, we look to address that. Um, additional highlights. In general, there's a strong culture of ownership of accepting students with disabilities within the districts and across the districts. A prop Approximately 5% of Fairfield Public School students with disabilities are play, that are placed through the PPT process um, in out-of-district placements, which is within expectations. Um, a review of IEPs suggests the need for more explicit, explicit linkages of goals and objectives to grade level expectations and present levels of academic and functional performance, which is pages four and five of your IEP. And uh, another... Um, highlight or recommendation for consideration is to, to continue to use the co-teaching model as an element of supporting um, the learning of students with disabilities. Continuing some recommendations for consideration from them um, is the development of central diagnostic teams or central evaluation teams. I know our colleagues in Greenwich have central diagnostic teams. I'm um, in the process of trying to contact my colleague um, in the Greenwich Special Ed Department. Um, this is a way that we could um, create more consistency throughout the evaluation process, the eligibility determination process, and the IEP development process. Um, various models were recommended with some advantages and disadvantages of each model. And then um, another recommendation to consider is to reorganize the, um, the coordinators of special education model. Um, particularly, they, they discussed considering um, the addition of a related services um, coordinator, an added district coordinator, um, or an additional high school coordinator with, um, with points to consider. Um, another important point is they considered that um, they recommended that we develop long range plans to, relative to the delivery of speech and language. Um, services as well as occupational therapy services in the district so we look forward to working with our colleagues in those departments um, to do that work and then in terms of continuum of services or continuum of supports continue to refine our co-teaching model and to continue to monitor our out-of-district out placements closely which I think we're making a lot of progress already next steps is to consider the recommendation and um, you know any proposed proposals um, that may impact our 1819 or our 1920 excuse me special education budget proposal and then there's several um, opportunities for professional development um, within this report to work on including PPT facilitation IEP development process um, delivery of speech and language and occupational therapy services and co-teaching models. Um, consultants will be at the Board of Education meeting on November 13th for a more detailed presentation of the audit and the Board of Education will have the opportunity to ask more in detail questions at that time. I hope that was not too quick. We wanted to give the highlights uh, because we could not get the person to come here because he had the other commitment. Um, so uh, if you have questions in the meantime prior to the consultant coming, as always, it's good if you can give those to Dr. Jones so the consultant and Bob can be ready with them. We have time for one quick question. Uh, oh, I thought, okay, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Uh, just for the 78% um, the of time spent with our regular students, is that 2017 18 data? Or is it's 16 17 data. Uh, That's the most recent data. There, that was my one question. Okay. Uh, 
Seeing nobody else raise their hand, uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, Ms. Pitko, Ms. Pitko, Ms. Max and Canelli, all in favor, raise your hand. It's uh, 8 to 0. Thank you very much. Yes, yes.